We have the esteemed California Commission members with us, um, President Mike Sutton. So we've made the decision on the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission that um, we're going to be called Royal Highnesses from now on um, because the President is way below us. <laughs> so President Mike Sutton, um, Commissioner, our Vice President, better introduce yourself because I'll screw this up. The bios. Imperial Dragon Rogers. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is Jackie Hossler Carmison, and I am the newest commissioner. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm the oldest. <laughs> very good. And Santi Mastrup, our executive director, and Chuck Bonham, who is the director of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Thank Welcome you. to all of you. You can move the microphone where it's comfortable for you. And you can move it out of your face like this if you don't want to talk, okay? Um, so what else do I need to say? Director Melcher, welcome. Welcome, Bruce. Nice to see you all. Um, we will start with um, Klamath Basin Restoration. Madam Chair, let me uh, No, we don't know the rules. Go ahead. I just want to thank you and the Commission and the Department for hosting uh, us here in Medford. Um, we from California have a lot to learn from Oregon, and we've been wanting to do this for quite some time. Uh, we think uh, we have a lot to learn from each other, and we can probably learn a lot about salmon conservation and management from Oregon. Probably learn a lot about how to live with wolves when they come to California from you in Oregon. We've got a few we'll send you. <laughs> and we can, uh, we can share our experiences with things like forage fish management and uh, facing out that ammunition for hunting and so forth that we're dealing with in California with you all. So uh, I'm, all of us are really looking forward to today and to learning a lot about it. I hate to admit it, but, and I probably shouldn't say this as the president of the California Commission, but I actually hunt and fish more in Oregon over the years than I have in California. Out of state license fees are going up. <laughs> so it's a He's coaching for you. <laughs> And I have had the pleasure of knowing your vice chair for many years, uh, for better That's reasons. what's wrong with you. <laughs> so, we welcome you. We welcome you. Even if you do know Mike. <laughs> Mr. Melcher. Thank you. Uh, Chair Lee, I did want to mention as well with the, with the agreement of the collective commissioners here that we <clears throat> would like to add an agenda item after our first three topics. Uh, a 20 minute block for public comment and we'll, we'll take a quick poll when that comes to see how many individuals there are that would like to address the joint commissions and then we'll have a lot of time for you. Well, I was supposed to say that but I didn't so he's making sure it gets in there and everybody's nodding yes. And then I'd, I'd also, I guess just briefly, I think it'd be important for our commissioners also to introduce themselves and and, uh, and Roy's got his hand up but we'll, we'll talk to you off on the side, Roy. Um, I, I wanted to welcome everybody to this Bob Mace Watchful Wildlife Center here. Bob Mace was a longtime department employee for, for the Game Commission in Oregon and then for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. He retired in 1981 as the deputy director. He spent a long career, even post-retirement, working with the department. He was our, our member, Oregon's representative on the North Pacific Fishery Management Council from its inception in 1976 until I retired from that position in about 2001, I believe it was. <coughs> incredibly, uh, had an incredibly diverse background. He, his family trust donated the funds to build this building here on the Jackson County Fairgrounds. We have a number of partnerships with the family trust as well as it relates to the restoration and enhancement activities. And Bob Mace said something once that I just, for me, it was always, I remember it to this day, and so I won't share it here, I'll probably share it again tomorrow with his family. But Bob Mates in North Pacific Council learning that Bob, Oregon is one boat, um, and there's about eight Alaskan boats, and three from Washington and Oregon. And our boat is always we're very critical in that, in that arena. Bob Mates held that seat for almost three decades, and he once said that he considers the last person that speaks that public testimony at a council meeting it's just as important as the first person that calls him on the phone. In other words, nobody gets special privilege when it comes to the decision making. He 
listens to everyone, whether they're the last person in public comment or the first person who calls on the phone. I, for me, that's always been very meaningful, and, and uh, I try to do that as well in my career. So I want to share that Bob Mace. That Bob Mace quote from the call. And it's on the record now. Well, we totally agree with you because that's how we run the commission. Everybody gets to equal vote and equal say. So, um, Commissioner Finley, we'll start with you. You can introduce yourself and go on down the line. Okay, um, my name's Mike Finley. I actually grew up here. And speaking of the Mace building, uh, I used to hunt and fish uh, when I started about 10 years old on the Mace property on the Rogue River, both pheasants and ducks, and then salmon fishing. So, the name Mace and the informal conversations I had with him growing up are also important. Um, I represent the western part of the state. For those of you who don't know, in California, we, we have seven commissioners, um, six of which are now filled, um, one in each congressional district, and then one for Eastern Oregon, and then one for Western Oregon. So I'm the commissioner for Western Oregon. Welcome, uh, California colleagues, even you seven. <laughs> I'm Commissioner Holly Akinson, and I'm from Malau County, which is the far opposite corner of the state, a uh, 10-hour drive from here, and I represent east of uh, the Cascades, or I'm from that district. I'm Bob Weber. I represent, I guess, the, the southwest, which miraculously doesn't include Metro. Um, I live on the Elk River down by Port Orford. Uh, I, Lived in Medford for 30 years, just over a year. Actually, lived in Central Point, um, and uh, good to come back here on occasion. And, uh, good to see all my old friends from over here. And I'm Commissioner Laura Anderson. I am from Newport, Oregon. Um, but I like to think that I represent everything west of the high tide line. So the marine uh, fisheries, uh, have a marine fisheries experience. Thank you. I'm Greg Woolley. I live in Portland. I've been in Portland about 25 years. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay, uh, fishing around the bay, in Clear Lake and Lake Area, and places like that. Uh, so I represent uh, Portland metro area in the, in the northwest uh, corner of the state. And I'm obviously Chair Bobby Levy. I'm from a little tiny town called Echo. It has 635 people in it. Stand quit laughing. Um, so, um, and I represent District 2. So let's start. Come on up. Yeah, I've seen you forever, Chip. How are you? I'm doing well. You look good. Yeah, my not very well. You don't talk to me. Yeah. Well, this will be a challenge given uh, two commissions, the chair and president. You can handle so. it very well. Okay, thanks. Uh, commissioners, directors, Bonham, Mastro, and Melcher, good morning. My name is Chip Dale, and I'm the uh, a watershed manager station out of Bend, Oregon, work for Fish and Wildlife, Oregon Fish and Wildlife. I'm going to give a little background around the settlement agreements that have been uh, accomplished with the Klamath Basin. So please indulge me. I apologize if it's a little long, but it was a good 10 years worth of process to get us there, and I'm going to try and cover it in about 30 minutes. Um, this presentation, I want to recognize Ed Sheets, who's facilitated through much of the uh, negotiations and process, loaned me the slides, some of the slides, and basically gave me uh, permission to go ahead and use them. He thought through it long before I had in terms of a presentation. First, a little background, a little history of the Klamath Basin, for those of you not familiar with the Klamath Basin. Um, there's a lot of anthropogenic effects in the basin that have really gotten us where we are today. The first one started in 1905 with the reclamation project, in which I believe was the first reclamation project in the United States. And in the term of reclamation, I want everybody to understand they weren't reclaiming water, they were reclaiming land. So what was once a very large and extensive marsh area in south and southern Oregon, when those lands were reclaimed for agricultural purposes, basically by diking and pumping water out of those 
those systems and then later putting water back on. Also, one of the earliest of its kind, uh, the Lower Klamath Refuge, was established in 1908. It may have actually been the first of the refuge system to be established. And then in 1918, the first dam on the Klamath River to affect fisheries, Kopko 1, was built. That dam is about a river mile, uh, 198 Klamath River, so it blocked any anatomous fish passage from there on up into the historic ranges in the upper basin in, in Oregon. Uh, 1921, when River Dam was built, that was a dam that added elevation to a reef that was on the outflow of Upper Klamath Lake. That facilitated water management and also allowed for development of two small hydros called East and West that are right there in the city of Klamath Falls. Um, 1925, Copco Dam Number 2 was built, and also Gerber Dam. The significance of Gerber Dam is it was the first impact or the first dam to be built that was affecting the Lost River cycle because it's on the Lost River. The uh, Tule Lake Refuge came into being in 1928. J.C. Boyle came into being in 1958. There's one Oregon dam that's part of the hydroelectric system. It was part of the California Oregon Power Company. And in 1962, Iron Gate Dam was completed, the last of the four main stem dams on the Klamath River. In 1975, Oregon started the adjudication process to try and appropriate the waters of the Klamath Basin. That met with a whole series of litigation, legal hurrahs, and basically even went to the Supreme Court when it was finally remanded back to the state of Oregon to continue that adjudication process, which was only recently completed. 1988, the Lost River and Short Mill Suckers were listed under the federal ESA as endangered. Those are two fish that are prevalent in the upper basin of Klamath Lake and the Lost River. And then in 1997, the federal listing of Klamath Coho under the Endangered Species Act was threatened. A little bit of the geography. Um, as you can see, the upper basin is predominantly the aglands that uh, we're talking about in the Klamath Bureau Reclamation Project. The river itself is actually from Upper Klamath Lake downstream is the definition of the Klamath River with four major tributaries in California, the Shasta, Trinity, um, Salmon, and, uh, and the um, Scott. Thing. Um, and in the upper basin, the main tributaries of Upper Klamath Lake are the Spray, Williamson, Wood River to a lesser extent, and then the Lost River. So what brings us to a uh, recent history of what we've experienced in 2001. By 2001, because of the, Enda the Endangered Species Act, there was a biological opinion issued the Bureau of Reclamation. It said that the lake levels would be managed date certain for a certain elevation. Inflows predicted into Klamath Lake were such that the drought condition that those could not be met, so there was a shutoff of all water deliveries to the irrigation system that is fed by the Bureau of Reclamation Project. Later on in the summer, there was about 70,000 acre feet of water made available to the agricultural interest. But keep in mind, this program historically delivered over 400,000 acre feet of water a year to agricultural purposes in the basin. In 2002, a major salmon die-off in the lower Klamath River, primarily Chinook, but also Coho and likely Steelhead. 35 to 70,000 fish died in that die-off. Those were adults returning. Um, and then in 2006, the returns to the Klamath had hit such a point that basically there was a closure of the commercial fishery in the Klamath Management Zone, a significant effect on fisheries up and down the California and Oregon coast. So the stage has been set with regard to the perfect storm for the issues that were brewing in the Klamath. The factors that kind of came into play that really started folks down the road to come to some sort of settlement. First off was the Klamath River projects, hydroelectric projects, were up for relicensing. Their license expired in the 2000s, and they needed to relicense those projects, so that created a venue for, for working on them. Uh, power rate increases were coming because with the expiration of license, the Pacific Corps decided it no longer would honor a power rate uh, deal with the irrigation districts that delivered very cheap power, which was very important to them because of the extensive costs they incurred in terms of pumping water out of those systems in order to <coughs> use those former wetlands that wetted up every spring. Uh, the Klamath Water Adjudication was coming online. Oregon was nearing a resolution of that adjudication, so lots of folks were interested to see what would happen with that. 
the uh, Bureau of Reclamation had two biological assessments at that point in time, one for the suckers in the lake and one for what was to occur with regard to Coho Downriver. They were almost dueling assessments because demands for water, whether it be stream flow for salmon down the river or lake levels for suckers up above. Uh, fish die-offs that continue to be problematic in the fisheries uh, failures. Litigation was always in the in the bailiwick. Um, there were irrigators suing over the shutoffs, irrigators who were over the authority of the OR to shut off. And then there was the realization by the tribes involved, four main tribes that were at the table at the time, that they really needed some help with revitalizing their economies and their food. And those tribes are the uh, the Klamaths of Oregon, the Yurok's Karooks, and at one time the Hoopa Valley. What came out of the negotiations that moved forward, and they, they moved forward at fits and starts, as Director Bonham could share with you. Um, what came out were two different agreements, but they were joined at the hip. Both of them had to occur for one of them to succeed. Uh, those are the Climate Basin Restoration Agreement that addressed restoring um, fisheries and communities, and then the Climate Hydroelectric Settlement, which had to do with the removal of the dams in the climate phase. Reasons for those two being separate were one, the main reason was is the uh, Pacific Corps had no interest in signing on to the climate based and restoration agreement. They felt they had no part or obligation in that, but they were, of course, part and parcel of the hydroelectric settlement. And then the other aspect was the United States government could not sign on to the KBR, KBRA because it was committing resources and it was pre decisional for Congress if they were to assign on. So, as you can see, the list of parties that were involved in this negotiation process and signatory to those agreements is pretty extensive. We have agencies from three departments in the federal government. We have the states of California and Oregon and their respective agencies that participated. Pacific Corp, of course, as the hydroelectric company. The tribes of Peru, Klamath, and Europe, but the Hoopas were there at the table through most of the negotiations. The counties that were involved in negotiations, the signatory counties were Humboldt and Klamath County, but again, Siskiyou County was at the table through much of the negotiation of the ADRA just couldn't get to the signature. Numerous irrigation organizations were there. The Klamath Project users were a very extensive group of irrigation districts that were signatories to it, and then there was a, a, a group of upper basin signatories that were party to it, but not all of the upper basin. And there's numerous, numerous non-governmental agencies were represented by the different um, groups that were advocating for fish restoration and wildlife habitat. All in all, it's pretty much a full meal deal about everybody who represents. In the end, the basin agreement principles that were brought forward was it was uh, condition precedent on the removal of those four dams. They needed to be out of the system. It was. Uh, on the precedent that we would restore the fisheries and restore those to sustainable fisheries and the fisheries that were naturally produced. Establish reliable water and power sources for the irrigation interests and then contribute to the public welfare and sustainable communities, both tribal and non-tribal. So what's in the Basin Agreement Program? So the, the Basin Agreement Program, the KBRA, has um, numerous different sections, a fisheries restoration section that talks about reintroduction and restoration, a water resources program that describes what the gifts to get are for the water users in the basin, uh, a program to describe how to deal with regulatory assurances. We had communities that were deathly afraid of the effects of ESA and the consequences of reintroducing fish into the basin. We had a power resources program in order to facilitate dealing with the uh, rate increases that were portending with regard to power in the basin. We had a county mitigation and, and benefits program, and that was to address some of the county's concerns and wants and needs associated with the project. And then the tribal programs, and finally, we did describe an, a government, an implementing governance so that there was order to the, to the outcome. Going over the fisheries program, there's two phases with regard to the reintroduction program. This is a fairly significant one. The first phase is to go through the investigations and then do the actions that would bring anatomous fish back into the upper basin. We would anticipate with the removal of the dams there would be a fair amount of fish movement by volition. 
but when we start looking at those historic habitats above Klamath Lake, that'll probably take much more intervention. The second phase of the reintroduction would be to bring the reintroduced populations into the management schemes for the broader Klamath River Basin, which has fairly significant fisheries associated with it. Fisheries restoration plan, this is primarily the habitat plan. The first phase is identifying basically a plan how to move forward and developing all those priorities, really looking at repairing restoration, stream channel restoration, fish passage and streaming. Um, and then the second phase is actually implement those and using adaptive management look at where the priority should be and evaluate what the effectiveness is. And finally, uh, a plan for a comprehensive monitoring plan. That comprehensive plan is to look at both what's going on with the fish populations, whether they're introduced or they're the populations that are currently in, in the system, um, monitor them, look at how they're doing, and then also use that information to help direct and guide the restoration activities associated with the restoration. Water Resources Program has different users that had different wants. So this is broken out differently depending on whether they were the on-project users, off-project users, or the environmental law. The first one being the on-project users, these are the Klamath VOR project users that had a long history since early 1900s of water deliveries through the Bureau Reclamation Project. One of the things that was very significant in this agreement was that those project users agreed to a reduced allocation of water out of the climate system. Mind you, in the peak years, they would take sometimes upwards of 450,000 acre feet of water. They agreed to basically restricting their take of water to about 340,000 acre feet, depending on the nature of the water year, with a reversal of what historically had happened. Historically, the driest years, they use the most water. Under the, new, uh, under the new agreement, the driest years, they get less water. The wetter years, there's more water available. And basically, they also agreed to a plan that they would develop a management plan for those project users that would allow them to live within the allocation that they, they all agreed to. Also very significant in that water program is an allocation for the refuges. Those federal refuges never really had a true allocation of water. Instead, they were receiving water contractually or basically as an artifact of the Tule Lake Ag Management and other activities that by the Bureau of Reclamation Project. So it set in place an allocation of water, and I forget the exact number, but the assurance that those refuges would have water in the future as part of the climate project. And then finally, there were terms set forth in the water in the water program so that the climate water users who were agreeing to sit with the tribes, which we were figuring at that time would be in the driver's seat on water, would have a way to resume, you know, resolve the disputes that would come out of the adjudication before the adjudication was done. The off-project water users were a whole different crowd. This was all the folks that were in the upper basin distributed. They were the independent farmers, not necessarily in any organization. The plan had called for um, what was needed in order to do the mass balance with water for fish flows and for lake levels and agriculture. We are looking at needing another 30,000 acre feet of water. So the idea was is to come up with opportunities in the upper basin where there was water consumption associated with irrigation, primarily with ranching communities, to try and achieve another 30,000 acre feet of water through voluntary uh, voluntary. Um, also, it described protection of uh, in-stream transfers and flows that were going to occur in the future, protection of repairing corridors and also stream habitat. And then finally, actually, it called for a settlement of those water issues in the upper basin that we didn't quite get to by the end of the time that we were ready to sign the climate restoration. Another aspect of it was additional water conservation and storage. So there were measures that were described in the KDRA. Some of those that are additional storage are the concepts of basically taking out some of the dikes and restoring those wetlands that are adjacent, such as Agency Lake. And also, it is akin to what's already been done on the Williamson and Tulane Farm, so a dike was removed by a major conservancy, and basically large tracts of that area were reweighed. In fact, of creating more water for storage but also creating more fringe habitat for suckers. 
Other things that were under consideration in this is should the opportunity arise for future storage that didn't impact the resources and, and was a, not necessarily on-channel, but an off-channel storage, we would agree to look at something like that. And then finally, a drought management plan to deal with the drought years that we are already. Environmental water is the one aspect that was the new one. That was the recognition that fish need water and that we needed to set aside and work to make sure there was water for fish and water for water quality issues that are prevalent in the basin. Uh, some of the measures that create that environmental water are already talked to the dam removal, uh, diversion limitations as agreed to by the water users, water rights retirement, trying to get the 30,000 acre feet to be applied, some of it for environmental water, um, storage opportunities, conservation, and then some interim water leasing where we can get water and put down river in critical time. Also, it describes the measure to protect environmental water. But one of the key components of this portion of the plan related to water is it sets up a scheme for a real-time water management. And what that means is instead of being any dueling biological opinions, there's a mass balance of water and when we can look at the water here, we look at conditions, what's going on with salmon downriver, we look at what's going on with sucker river, upriver. The biologists have a place at the table and the fisheries interests have a place at the table to work with Bureau Rec and the other water managers in order to balance that rather than be set to a rigid set of rules. The regulatory assurances that are spelled out in the plan of space and restoration agreement are really driven by you to say more than anything else. Uh, the approach to that would be to develop conservation plans, have that conservation plan in order to give them some coverage and, and, and some sort of a safe harbor, primarily for the irrigators. But also it, it, it embrace that the biological opinion needs to be more reflective of what the future will be with the dam removals and progress that are being made in the basin. Uh, other things that are in insurances is that, uh, that the uh, irrigators will not run into problems with existing diversions and, and getting approval. The, uh, they also commit to avoidance of impact and future impact. Another big thing is screening. In the basin, there is a high need for screening throughout the basin. So it sets forth uh, working on getting a lot of those diversions. The power resources program basically is looking at providing uh, our cost <coughs> so they aren't basically caught up in our price variations and fluctuations, not only for the um, Bureau Reclamation Project itself, but also for the refuges, which are also subject to that. Um, it established an interim power sustainability fund and also set forth the effort to look for long-term renewable power investments, for not only for revenue income, but also for Another key component of this one is to shift that BOR loads of power to federal project power. What this means is basically, historically, the Bureau of Reclamation had the price agreement with Pacific Power, and basically all the cost of that electricity associated with Bureau Rec was billed back to the water users that were using that water and receiving the deliveries. So they were incurring the cost. This is an attempt to move the Bureau of Reclamation into a category that they can utilize the Bonneville Power Administration power that can be wheeled to the Bureau of Reclamation, which is a lower cost power structure than what would otherwise be available. And then and finally, more in a recognition of developing a better efficiency in terms of energy and conservation, both with on farm investments and also investments in the infrastructure delivery. The counties program are basically uh, Siskiyou, Humboldt, and Klamath counties um, funding to help them offset loss of tax revenue. Uh, there is some tax revenue associated with hydroelectric plants, which will go away, but there's uh, also some uh, real estate tax uh, risk associated with as water rights retirements come along or the dams are removed. There was a feeling that there would be a loss in land valuation and concomitant loss in real estate tax revenue. Uh, but it also was to set aside funds to help provide for some economic development opportunities investigations. It was going to be a different world without the dams and we an opportunity for them to look at other types of development. And then also it calls for some assurances to the counties in relation to when the dams are removed that basically shoreline will be rehabilitated. They won't just be left with the scar on the land that basically recognition was its own. 
And then finally, it called for a recognition that if there were impacts associated with the removal of property, that would be taken care of. The tribal program, again, providing them some resources to start participating much deeper into the fish restoration and land reduction, basically providing them funding for not only personnel, but also more resources for this day on a technical basis. Um, also, they want to help in dealing with developing uh, fishing economies. It's a long ways away from any market when you're at the mouth of the climate. So looking at helping with marketing, processing, and transport. And then tribal revitalization. One of the things that was interesting I came to learn was the Yurok Reservation. 40% of those people don't even have electricity. So there's a real call there for revitalization of those communities not only from the standpoint of the cultural preservation and also from the standpoint of self-government, but also the infrastructure that's lacking in many of those communities. Finally, the coordination and oversight of established their governance based on a uh, concept of the Basin Coordinating Council. These are groups that are signatory parties to the Climate Based Restoration Agreement that will oversee the implementation of those actions. We can't get away without talking about funding. The original price tag for all of the items that were identified was somewhere in the tune of $900 million. Uh, that was dropped about $750 million with some economies that we could come up with. Uh, now it's actually lower than that because there's been some analyses on their current federal programs that are being spent in the base and it can be uh, basically directed towards the restoration agreement. But there's about $250 million in that price tag that are really going to require new federal authorization, not just the appropriation, but federal authorization to allow those to move forward. And then in addition, there's about $550 million in non-federal funding in the whole program, including the hydro settlement agreement. That $550 million is both the money being generated for dam removal, which are non-federal, and also money is being generated, whether they're through the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, through some of the uh, NGOs participating in the project, or other state endeavors in the base. Very briefly, I'll go through the hydroelectric settlement because it was a separate settlement. The goal here was the recognition there's 300 miles or so of habitat that was blocked by the dams in the lower river, and about 58 miles actually the river itself that's inundated under the pools of those dams. Um, just for a little perspective, if you've not seen the dams, um, the lowest dam being Iron Gate, probably one of the bigger pools of all, and one of the larger dams. Um, the Kapko one and two are right next to each other. Again, Kapko is a fairly large dam. And then J.C. Boyle, which is the Oregon Dam which actually is quite a bit different in structure and function because it is basically a diversion. It sends water about four miles down the canal, sends it dewatering the river, and then runs it down to a power plant below. So the hydroelectric settlement established a process, one, to start doing studies and environmental analysis that was called for to really make sure we can true up and do our, our truth and lending due diligence whether or not the dams can come out and should come out. And then it sets up the process that there'd be a decision by the Secretary of the Interior. And that decision was based on the question, is removal of the four dams in the public interest? And will removal of the four dams enhance fisheries? So there was an EIS undertaken by USDS. Uh, the EIS is out. The decision is essentially out that the uh, Secretary cannot make that decision until the legislation, you know, Congress has acted on the legislation. It also includes a process to transfer, decommission, and remove the dam. The uh, company that owns the dams wanted nothing to do with removing them. Uh, they agreed to the transfer, and, and then what was established is there would be a separate dam removal entity that would basically be in charge of removing them. It also set forth provisions for funding that removal because the federal government wanted nothing to do with paying for dam removals, and then provisions regarding the disposition of the property that's under the dams and associated with the dams with opportunity and mitigation and liability. Liability protection primarily for the power company that owns the property there that they worry about late. And then provisions set forth for the interim operations. We didn't necessarily want them to go back into the FERC process. We wanted to keep the 
first license in advance, but we did need some assurances that they would operate down responsibility to the benefit of the fish and the users. So the funding for the dam removal, there's about 200 million that's being generated by a surcharge on power um, bills to users. That includes not only um, individual households, but also commercial. Commercial is a little more out of it. Household is a fairly small addition to a, an electric bill. That required legislation in Oregon and I see in California that basically directed the PUC to go ahead and allow for that bill. Um, the other piece of those, and because the majority of the Pacific Core customers are in Oregon, the majority of the dam projects in California it was reconciled that we had looked at the state of California through a bond measure generate up to 250 million for the dam removal. And my understanding is that there is a water bond now that has been set forth from the California legislature will be up for a decision here this fall. This is all really predicated because the United States government was smart enough to recognize that they were never going to be able to get the funding to take another dam out after our so That took so long to get out, but this was a much more effective way to move it. Uh, inner measures really address dam operations, mitigation options that could be taken and implemented right away. Some of that's going on now, some gravel placement and whatnot. And then hatchery operations, and assurance that there would be funding to continue operation of Iron Gate Hatchery or something like that in order to continue producing up to the fisheries that are in demand associated with that hatchery. And then the schedule. The bottom line with the schedule is the dams are targeted for removal or transfer December 31st of 2020. So, going back to the piece that didn't get done under KBRA, this is a very near term piece. The, the, the restoration agreement called for us to go back to the table and try and reconcile the upper basin water users in the KBRA. Uh, those efforts weren't very successful, as Chuck would relate. We, we really struggled with some of those users during the negotiations. What happened was the Oregon adjudication came out, and as expected, the Klamath tribes ended out with some pretty good water rights associated with in-stream flow of the tributaries of Klamath Lake, based on a water right of time and memorial. So they really ended up being in the driver's seat with regard to water, and it had a fairly profound effect on those off-project water users. Um, then in conjunction with that, in 2013, we had a bad water year, the tribes made calls on those rivers and those water rights, and it shut off a lot of irrigation in the upper basin. They did not make the call on the project users, the Bureau Reclamation project users, but those folks had already negotiated with them through the KBRA for a settlement. Um, and, and from my experience, through the droughts and the water years we have had as of late, these agreements have gone a long way to avoid all the conflict fights in the basin that historically would have arisen in the circumstances, in like circumstances that we have now. At any rate, what happened was the uh, two senators from Oregon, Wyden and Merkley, Congressman Walden, Governor John Kitzhaber, called for a task force to basically reconcile those issues. Uh, <coughs> and they were commissioned to move forward in July of 2013 with representatives of the upper basin irrigators that fairly diverse group of folks. Climate tribes is the people that had something to give, but also looking for something to get. The state of Oregon and the United States government, primarily Department of Interior, basically served as facilitators to this process. It was led by um, Richard Whitman out of the um, governor of Oregon's office and by John Bestick out of the Department of Interior in D.C. They signed an uh, agreement to principle in December of 2013 and finally came to a final agreement in April of 2014. This agreement basically set forth that it gave us the, um, the road in to find the 30,000 acre feet of water. The off project water users bought into that in exchange for a stable and sustainable uh, agriculture based on getting some water and some abundance of calls on them by the tribe. It also gave an inroad to getting onto those lands, which is very important as it relates to water quality and inflow into climate lake. Gave an uh, access agreement to, to the climate tribes and others in order to do work on repairing and maintenance of current conditions. And then it basically gave some help and assistance further beyond what was in the settlement agreement to the um, 
trying to trying to work in both in terms of economic development and in terms of cultural um, cultural. <coughs> I mean, in summary, what, what's been accomplished after all of these years, um, those agreements were signed in 2010. As, uh, as those of us at the table at the time of negotiations, we spent probably six years negotiating in, in the long run on this. But we're pretty proud of what's been accomplished thus far. <laughs> 46 parties have formed the Climate Space and Coordinating Council to oversee the implementation. Work continues on that. We developed an outline which goes to the fisheries restoration monitoring plan, at least the paperwork is getting done on that end. We developed a drought plan in order to deal with these dry years that we're seeing in the basin. The dam removal studies were completed. A little bit of history there. We set aside $450 million as the ticket price is the estimate. Uh, last I heard, the dam removal cost came in close to $100 million based on the investigations and calculations done by the Bureau of Reclamation's engineer. We'll see how that pans out, depending on what the economy is doing, and people are pretty hungry for work at the time they did those calculations. Um, the dam removal fund is, to date has collected over $72 million, so that's moving along, primarily surcharges. Uh, California has um, put the bond measure up. Um, all of the inner measures with the hydroelectric settlement, working with Pacific Core, they've been very cooperative. Just recently, last week, they agreed to release water out of Iron Gate for some of the issues we're dealing with in the lower river associated with salmon health. And then the upper basin programs have been started. Those are the programs associated with the off project one. The next step, basically, we need congressional action. As you all know, in this days and times, getting Congress to act on anything these days has been a challenge, but people are working that pretty hard back in D.C. Once that is done, the secretarial determination to be made, and then the funding requirements to be completed to start. And with that, if I can answer any questions, I'd be glad to. Commissioner, sure, any one. questions? We'll start with California. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chip, for this presentation. You know, we asked for this to be on our joint agenda because we recognize that climate is one of our most important shared resources. Two thirds of the climate basin, approximately in California, the upper basins in Oregon, um, and we recognize the the longstanding nature. Of that. More than 100 years ago, the market hunters were shipping 120 tons of waterfowl meat a year to the markets of San Francisco. That was a big threat in those days. That was why the climate refuges were established by President Theodore Roosevelt to stop market hunting. In fact, Oregon. Not many people know this. The Oregon legislature outlawed market hunting long before the Migratory Bird Treaty Act was passed by Congress. So we have Oregon to thank for the cessation of market hunting and uh, showing the feds the way. And it looks like we're doing it again here. Um, so we have a long-standing interest in the climate. We also have a long-standing interest in dam removal. The largest dam removal in Cal Project California history is happening in my backyard in Carmel River. The dam's over 100 feet tall. And it's turning out like the Elwha. We're, we're learning how to do it. We're going around. We're, we're ch channeling the Carmel River around the dam, leaving most of the sediment there. Uh, and so we learned a lot. Uh, California, as, as Chip pointed out, has put uh, its share of the, of the cost of climate based restoration in Proposition 1, which is on the November ballot for California voters to approve. Yesterday, our commission sent a letter to, uh, agreed to send a letter to Secretary Jewell. Interior Secretary Jewell, thanking her for releasing water from, and the Bureau of Reclamation for releasing water for anatomous fishes in the climate system and the Trinity system, uh, and asking her to provide some additional water for the climate refuges out of our concern over migratory waterfowl habitat this fall. As you know, California is pretty dry, and we're, uh, uh, Director Bonham and his staff have been all drought all the time these days, and uh, so I know they're going to have some things to say about this. But we, we want to be a partner with you all in the restoration of the Climate Basin, which, after all, is the largest river restoration project the United States has ever attempted. Bigger than Everglades, bigger than anything we've tried before. If we can, our feeling is if we can succeed in the climate, we can do this anywhere. We might even be able to do it in the Sacramento someday. So, thank you again. Director Bonham. Just tilted to the correct chair. 
You just talk away. Okay. Yeah, I thought I'd, if I could for a quick moment do three things. I'd like to introduce California to you. I'd like to just say a few remarks about the Klamath from my heart and then uh, tell you what we've been focused on in the last year. So, we have, as you know, a commission that's comprised of five members. It is not geographically divided like your commission. They're actually uh, created in our constitution. So they trace as a commission to the origins of the state. It has an executive director and staff. And uh, that budget for the commission is within our department's budget. Our department has been around as an executive kind of administrative agency since the 30s, but both the commission and the department trace to an 1849 Board of Fish Commissioners in the state. Our department has about 3,000 employees. Our annual budget is about 400 million. There are about 2 million, I'm rounding up a little, annual resident hunters and anglers. In the context of a population of 38 million, which is predicted to be 50 million by 2049. And we, I think we have maybe the most number of species, we have about 6,400 species all in. About 350 are federally or state protected in some form. And we have the highest number of endemic species of any state in the Union, meaning those which are found nowhere else. And so that's the introduction. Clement, I sat through a decade of difficult times with CHIP in my prior capacity as an attorney and state director for Trout Unlimited. Before getting the opportunity to have the greatest job in the world as director. And what has always struck me is how many people care about the Klamath from deep in their heart for so many different reasons. Most basins in the West typically have two or three conflicting interests when you get around to deciding a better approach. This basin has seven, eight, nine. It's got one of the oldest reclamation projects in farming communities in the West. There's four federally recognized tribes. Got some of the nation's first refuges, protected fish in the lake, protected fish down in the river in California, a federal licensed hydro project. It's got federal lands, two states, local governments, commercial fishing interests along our ports, and national interests repeatedly intervene in the basin to express their own agendas, whether they're political or otherwise. So, you know, seeing the reclamation project turned off in 2000, which is the first time I've been for the United States Department of the Interior ever, and watching the strife on the streets of Klamath Falls, which was emotional for anyone involved, seeing the largest fish kill just two years later in recorded history, let alone the tribes telling us in their history, never seen before. Our department did a definitive study, I think 60 something thousand fish were killed. To walking the abandoned wharfs in 2006, seeing the commercial fishery disaster, most people told us it couldn't be done. We couldn't figure out a way to design a future where everybody gets better together. Fast forward, I think that's where you are today. As hard as it's been, as many forces that continue to seek to pull apart a coalition of 46 and growing. I think you find a deep commitment from your state, I believe your commission, our state, our commission, and many others to getting better together. So hats off to Oregon for the most recent agreement we produced in the Wood the Williams and the Sprague. That's phenomenal work. Yeah, I think it has gone a long way for our shared congressional delegation on the Senate side. Um, Senators Feinstein and Boxer are joining your senators to pursue legislation. What have we been doing in the last year? We have been shaped largely by drought. You two are in drought. It's the fourth likely year for us. 
Fifty-eight percent of the state is in exceptional drought right now, which is worse than extreme. Every county in our state is in some form of drought. It's producing substantial impacts for our farming community in the Central Valley. We're following a substantial amount of land. It's about a one point five billion dollar impact to date, and it's running. Now, of course, that's in the context of a two trillion dollar a year annual GDP for the state. So we have tributaries to the Klamath, the Scott, and the Shasta, which are like your Wood Williamson and Spray. There are important rural community interests and values. There's long-running agricultural activity and ranching. And there's often been a challenge between our department, other agencies, and landowners finding a better way together. So we've spent the last months, both in the Scott and Shasta, extending pretty unique regulatory certainty offers to landowners. If you will come work with us for the time period that the governor's state of emergency for drought exists, we will extend what's called take coverage to you and reduce your exposure to prosecution under our state and neighbors Act if you will allow us access onto your properties, if you'll work with us to move fish from rapidly drying streams, if you'll agree to best business practices, and many said it couldn't be done, but today we've signed almost 20 of those type of agreements. And a result has been that we've moved about 100,000 juvenile coho from these two tributaries where they're just drying up to other spots um, that are more wet than those remaining tributaries. And we'll continue to kind of take that emergency-based approach to avoiding a disaster. And we are very thankful that the Department of the Interior, working with your state and Iris, has been able to release water down the Trinity side, Trinity River, for pushing cold water in the lower Klamath River to avoid an outbreak of uh, fish disease called it. And that this week, with the cooperation of Pacific Corps, produced an additional volume of water um, because the fish are now in the upper system and we're seeing the big outbreak. In some respects for us, we've never been in such a situation driven by drought. Uh, and I concur completely with Chip. Absent uh, decades worth of dialogue and conversation, the foundation laid for the nation's largest restoration project that also produces water supply reliability for landowners. I don't think we have survived the last year in California. So thank you for the few moments, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rod. Any questions? Oh, what was the title again? I forgot. <laughs> Any further questions from, or comments from California? I have one question for Chip. Chip, uh, I noticed that you had a hoopla on some of the slides, but not on the initial slide. Where is the Hoopa tribe in their agreement on the part of the 46 parties? I hate to speak for the Hoopers, to be honest with you. They were at the table too much in the negotiations. I think they had concerns about the effects of the KBRA on some of their needs related to their previous settlements. Um, and, and Director Bonham may have a better answer, but I, I believe they were supportive of the, plan of the dam removal, but have basically been reluctant to sign on to the KBRA. I think that's accurate, Commissioner. And just for geographic reference, your Klamath tribe here in Oregon as a federally recognized tribe. There are three federally recognized tribes on the California part of this basin. The Karoo tribe, kind of mid-river, if you will. The Hoopa Valley tribe, whose reservation is on the Trinity, very, very right at the trinity Klamath confluence. And then the Yurok tribe, whose reservation is on the Klamath. All four tribes participated in Negotiations. Each tribe needed to make up their own mind based on their own sovereignty and uh, self-determination views. Hoopa did not sign. I believe Hoopa, Hoopa views some of the issues relative to whether the federal government is advocating their trust responsibility through the form of agreements. I personally take a different view of that legal issue. Um, but I also believe why you see Hoopa mentioned on subsequent slides is there's an opt-in provision. 
um, particularly when it comes to implementing tribal um, community development components of the agreement. So I believe the parties would welcome any tribe that wants to opt in as we're going forward in the future. One, one, I'm sorry, one last question. You mentioned in the settlement that there was an infection of water to the tribes. Did I hear that correctly? Um, no. I'm not sure whether the chair says it. Um, Commissioner, we, we, there was a reduction of water deliveries to the um, irrigators okay. that they agreed to. Um, what, I, what, there, what is happening is, is we've had agreements from the Klamath tribes, which are the ones that really ended up with adjudicated water rights, that they would pretty much put some of their calls in abeyance in exchange for the outcomes of the settlement agreement. So basically, they, 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 they didn't give up their water, but more in the case that they, they avoided making some calls. Thank you. I thought I might give a little bit of a historical perspective, at least from my side of it, being an observer of this since the early 80s. Um, I first got involved in California water issues in very early 80s when I was on the original California Urban Water Conservation Council. And we were, at that point in time, as you may know, the urban California uses of the, of the uh, developed water supply, only 13%, you know, 87% goes to agriculture. And of that 13%, an individual homeowner has only about half. 13%, so 6 or 7%. So the idea back in the early droughts of, of somebody standing in a bucket under a shower and taking that water outside had virtually no impact whatsoever on, on water conservation. But politically, it sounded good, and, and uh, people were involved. And it looked like it was really working. The issue on water conservation is in the farm. It is in agriculture, which, as you pointed out, has a very minimum percentage of California's GDP, but uses 87% of the water. I've been doing California um, work at the policy level for 16 years. I was chairman of Forest Practice on the Board of Forest Three, and I've now been on this commission for 10 years. So I'm sort of the old guy. I'm now, since the founding of the commission in 1870, the second longest serving commission ever. I've had the president's job, I've had the vice president's job, and then I'm a commissioner. In all of that time, I have never seen as excited a cooperation effort with respect to water conservation, which is our life. Without that, without the appropriate uh, <coughs> usage of water and storage and plumbing systems and all of that. And in California, as perhaps you know, the last governor who actually did anything in that regard, in a substantive manner, was our current governor's father. The population of the state of California has tripled since that time. And there has been no major water development at all in the state. It is historic. This is a marvelous state because all of the users have been fairly represented and got involved in the process. Back in the 80s, when we were doing California urban water conservation, the environmentalists would sit on one side of the table and say, no, 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 no and virtually nothing got done. What you're seeing now is genuine progress. And I must, my hat's on to the director, yourself, Jim, and to everyone who has been involved in this. This is genuinely extraordinary. Thank you very much. Actually, from my experience, I guess this has been the epitome of how a democracy works, basically. What came from the ground and grassroots invested in this to reconciling their values and their conflicting values to bring forward something that basically is solution oriented. Everybody gave something to get something as Steve Thompson used to be very close. And it has been it actually rewarding activities participating, although grueling. Now you can't talk about it. Chip, just one more question. You're a climate veteran. You've been in this process. 
process integration. When you look into your crystal ball, what do you see? I mean, it's hard to imagine. Senator Wyman perhaps could get his bill through the Senate, but it's hard to imagine. We don't even have a House counterpart for that bill. I flew Congressman Huffman, Jared Huffman, who uh, represents the mouth of the climate and the, the California coast, North Coast, over the climate for the first time last month with a representative from Pacific Corps to look at the dams and see the entire picture. And he's interested in introducing a counterpart bill, but he has no Republican co-sponsor. It's hard to imagine that we're going to see legislation enacted. So what's going to happen in the next couple of years? Do you think? You want more to response? This is a question. You know, my crystal ball is one of, the, one of the things where the problems we're dealing with is we've written into the agreements that basically if it didn't get any congressional hearing by a time certain at the end of this year, then, then it was open to fall apart. We have a meeting scheduled with the principal parties are going to be meeting in Sacramento this month, on the 22nd. And, it, and it's, it's, it's that, you know, as, as the old saying goes, politics is personal. So one of the water, the representative water users says, you know, we need to sit face to face. We've been on the phone a lot in the air, but we need to sit face to face and talk through what we're going to do. Because there is that fear of resolving. I think there's some, I think there's some political strategies at work with regard to the care, to be honest with you. I, I, from little I've heard regarding the DC actions, the hearing may have first somehow. A lot of it depends on what the outcome of the November elections are in terms of the balance, and particularly what happens in the balance of the Senate as to what happens with those uh, committee chair chairmanships that are held by our respective senators. So that's in play. But I've got to tell you, I think, I think people that went through that process and have worked so hard on it don't see an alternative. They really don't see an alternative to it. So I think at least uh, I have to believe that the, the local communities and the local parties and groups want to stay engaged in the community. Can't tell you what happened. Well, I have to commend you, Jeff, because you're, you're soft-spoken. And you have the best interest at heart for everybody as a whole. And you're a consensus builder. And I have known that from the time I've met you, from the small talks that we've had. And I'm pleased to say that um, you're from Oregon, and we're glad for your hard work. Um, commissioners, comments or questions? Commissioner Finley. Um, I just uh, am thinking about uh, all the people I see in this room that I know, and, uh, members of the California Commission. I think with the merits of this so aptly described, uh, Jim, we have to be able to generate some uh, Republican interest. Uh, I hearken to a group we helped form in my day job, the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, um, guaranteeing you a place to hunt fish is their byline. They have 6.8 million affiliates. That's since 2002. Growth spectacular for any nonprofit. Trout and Limit was on your screen. I just can't imagine if we didn't take some uh, in front of the camera and behind the scenes action as individuals, and I'm going to commit to it right now, um, that we can't get some Republican sponsorship. But this would be a prideful bill. I can't imagine, and I know some Republican legislatures, legislators, um, who could take something that has this consensus, although uneven uh, and fragile, couldn't make something like this happen. And that would be what I hope we all do. Particularly, I think it was fruitful to get, come together here, if nothing more than to think about this, and leave with a campaign move. I mean, I think it should be a campaign. Get this introduced to the House. House the House. Send it to the Senate. You know, we get tired of the other thing. 
Well, the details of um, what's been going on in the planet are um, new to me, so I'm really excited to see that such a diverse group can work together towards solutions. And uh, I think it's a good sign that we can use that same model in other areas and other topics that people see that that grassroots coming together towards solutions can work. Um, down on some of the polarization on a lot of the issues that we have to deal with that, that have to come from the ground up which then include all the stakeholders. So I think it's a great model. Thank you. Commissioner Weber. Uh, having been in this area and fished in the planet police and lots of time, uh, listen to the various sites complain about the situation this is a stunning result, in my opinion. Um, and I think everybody involved should be congratulated and hopefully we can move something forward. Um, I had one question and on the slides. There was the uh, dam removal in 2020, and I didn't know if that was when it was going to start in or if that's sort of just a date. Uh, Commissioner Weber, that, that's actually the date the transfer becomes final and the dam removal can start. Basically part of the hydroelectric settlement agreement. Director Bond can help me in this speak. But the, um, the agreement gave some certainty to the company to operate for a certain period of time. They needed to basically go through their economic calculations and true that up. And that was the date upon which agreed that they would relinquish those facilities so that they can they can be legitimately transferred Thank you. Congratulations and thank you. Commissioner Anderson. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, all of those on the California delegation that have put so much time and effort over decades into um, this most monumental project. I guess I'm kind of um, taken aback by looking at the time frame and thinking, my, how time flies. It was only 150 years ago when this all started. Um, because I started flying uh, fish, salmon in 2002, right when that uh, most historic fish kill was, was happening. And after a couple of years of being in the business, being offered a disaster relief check and thinking to myself, what have I gotten myself into, really? This, is, uh, this does not look like a viable future, but yet here we are, um, still supporting healthy fisheries um, for, for many um, on our coasts. And part of the work that's come out of this disaster has been better management, time and area management, genetic um, identification of stocks at sea so that we can continue to have healthy economies. So I think there are some bright uh, silver linings, uh, if you will, in terms of how we improve communication and management. And I would hope I, 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 there was a kind of an inaudible chuckle in the room when it was suggested, I think you said, Chip, that gee, if we could do this, maybe we could actually do this in the Sacramento. And everyone's like, mm, yeah. <laughs> but I think that would be the goal. Um, because even though it's very obvious that we share a border, we share geography with our, um, with our uh, neighbors to, to the south. In the case of Sacramento, it's not necessarily the geography, but we certainly share these resources, uh, not just the flow of fish and, and birds and wolves that we'll talk about later, but the dollars that flow back and forth as well. So I hope that this is a, um, an opportunity to uh, continue to do more. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Anderson. Commissioner Woolley. Thank you. So I have a, a crystal ball question uh, for the California Commission. What, what is the prognosis at this point in passage of the bond? Uh, how's the campaign going? Is there an opposition? Uh, you give us a little brief on that. That would be great. So I know Director Farnham is going to want to weigh in on that, but I'll make just two quick comments. One is that the bond Proposition 1 is the water bond on the California ballot this year. It was uh, placed on the ballot by the legislature to 
is a good sign because the legislature passed that bond act by an overwhelming majority. Um, the other uh, good sign in terms of the passage is that the polling that's been done so far shows the bond passing by, again, a, a, a pretty wide margin. I think it's, I call it the silver lining of the drought, uh, that the California electorate knows we're in a drought, they know we're in trouble, they know we need drought relief. The bond is larger than the last water bond, Proposition 84 in 2006, which at the time was the largest conservation bond in U.S. history, $5.6 billion. This one's 7.5. And almost all the money goes for things like in-stream flow, wetlands restoration, watershed conservation, and so forth. Director Bonham's been more involved than I have. Thank you for the question. And just for the record, you know, I'm not able in my official capacity to comment on election issue, but I can provide you a factual update. So to confirm the president's first remark, the legislation that passed out of our uh, legislature was approved 37 to 0 in the Senate, and I think it was 77 to 2 in our lower chamber, which we call an assembly. And then it was signed about 9 p.m. on Wednesday evening by our governor. It's now Proposition that's an incredible expression of bipartisan support on arguably California's most contentious issue of water. Then as to polling, you know, many polls uh, can be designed to produce results, but most polls appear to be showing on this topic uh, you know, support in the high 50s. So, and as of yesterday, you begin to see Governor Brown actively express his view on both Proposition 1 and the companion proposition, which is a fiscal rainy day fund for us. And I believe if you asked him the question, he would say, save water, save money, save California. The uh, papers noted yesterday that Governor Brown has spent more money campaigning for Proposition 1 than he has for his own re-election. <laughs> so, he's not that he has anything to worry about that. Um, one of the things that's unusual about yeah, no, the There's a proper order here. I'm Go sorry. Ahead. So who tells you not to? Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, um, what's different about it, proper? Uh, is, because, because we've had confluence of drought and attempts to, to do water bonds and things of this nature previously. What's different about it is what is what has been mentioned, and that is this was on the legislature. This is a very different dynamic. Um, politics is is everything, everything, uh, and the politics have lined up appropriately to solve this problem. Uh, there have been a lot of uh, people who were voters in times past who were frightened away from bonds and, and just spending um, for a whole bunch of political reasons. This one is literally a, a, almost a water of life. It's being spun appropriately, uh, that it's incredibly important that we do this. And so the voter is actually understanding of it, not being politically charged up and doing something for political reasons. They're actually doing something for substantive reasons which is, I think, why this is going to pass very well. Chair, one other question. So I was just hard to hear about the economic status of the Europe. 40% uh, without electricity, to me that has a high, a connotation of a high poverty rate. So I was wondering um, just how dollars will be broken down. I think clients are doing better, I'm not sure about the other tribes. Uh, in terms of economic development uh, for the tribes, where is that going? Gary, we need Rachel Wood. Really, that what what the what the agreement sets up is funding for them to do that. And one of the big issues with the tribes during the discussion, particularly as we're going through the gyrations of trying to pair the budget to make it something palatable for Congress was that they wanted more self-determination related to how those dollars would be spent that came to them. And a big part of it, I think, what we see is that 
Um, I think they're viewing that the first step that they can move into for revitalization is going to be having an economy associated with fishery. At this point, I'm not sure they have much of an economic um, fishery program, but uh, I think they're looking at something like that into the future and then building upon that. Um, part of that lack of electricity, to be honest with you, is that the extremely rural dispersed population, and pardon me, but I think a part of California, that may be the case for a lot of non tribal folks also. Very remote country and not a lot of service. So we never got quite to the point of talking about service deliveries to them, but I think that could be built into some of the power stuff that they choose to do so in terms of helping develop some of the Mr. Rogers uh, actually caused me to think, which is, thank you. Um, if, if you uh, think about all of your experience, all of you in the room, um, you've had agreements with people, and you've watched agreements, uh, there's a shelf life. Um, players, people who negotiated, uh, this is perishable. And, and so I'm going to follow up on my last comment by just saying the effort that went into this is incredible, I think. Um, the delegates and the negotiators, uh, the shelf life is perishable. And uh, this is fragile, and, and I really think we should do everything we can to push this at any level we can to get this done. Because we will have wasted a really special opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So next we'll have one of my family's dear friends, Jason Atkinson. Come on up. And uh, Kristen, if you want to come sit up beside me as well. And we'll take your step right after me. And for the record, both of you, please introduce yourself. Good morning for the record. Uh, my name is Jason Atkinson. Uh, I'm here before you for the first time as a citizen. Um, having taken a sabbatical from public service to do nothing but the Klamath, which I'll explain in just a moment. Uh, let me tell you all uh, that this commission meeting was supposed to happen last year, and I was supposed to give a completely different uh, series of remarks to you last year. And uh, the series of remarks I'll give you today are uh, quite a bit more cheery. Um, it's very difficult to follow Chip. I think he did a fantastic job. Um, it's finally wonderful to meet Mr. Baum. He does, in fact, exist. Um, but I, I want to, I before I go too far, I, I, I think it's important, and um, uh, just by, by way of uh, experience, I think I carried nearly everyone on the Oregon side's uh, nominations on the floor. So my, the Senate floor, and so my history with the department goes considerably back uh, being somebody with a fish problem. Um, I would like to uh, publicly thank Roy Elker, uh, who is now with us today. Um, Roy was the director of Oregon Fish and Wildlife. He was the interim director twice, and he has just uh, decided to uh, move on in his career. Uh, Roy took over a department that uh, was before uh, any of our current commissioners were, were around, a commission and a department. I was here. I hired That was in some significant <laughs> issues, and he did, a, he did a wonderful, wonderful job. So. Uh, Chip has actually covered a tremendous amount of the river, but let me tell you a little bit more and shade it, and then I would like uh, two causes for action to leave you all with. If you will notice, uh, members who are not too familiar with the series of topics, and, and excusing Chip's PowerPoint, nobody who speaks on behalf of the Klamath uses notes. And that's because the Klamath is something very, very special. And we have invested something far more than our professional reputations, far more than our political reputations. 
uh, it really is true that there's something going on here that is more heart and history than is really appreciated. And having been a veteran of this for um, a long time, I am in a very odd predicament. Uh, I am raising the fifth generation, mid-river, in the exact same place my great-grandfather was, and raised around two of the tribes, and then elected to office in the agriculture part of the river basin and have a tremendous amount of family connection there. The problem with that is the pure guilt of my liberal, Reagan-hating grandmother and my Eisenhower Republican grandfather who told me, if you are given something to do, you do it. And they told me that this job, this river, I don't, I don't know any other way than just pure guilt that this is what you're supposed to do. And I will tell you that all of the work that is behind the scenes and all the work that's in front of the scenes, there's a huge missing constituency to understanding the clan. Everyone who's in this room today is part of the choir. Whether or not you agree with KBRA or not, you're part of the choir. We talk, biologists and legal talk, we talk in timelines and studies and task forces. The problem is, is that this is the largest conservation project in American history. Nothing as big as this has ever been attempted. And yet nobody outside this room knows it. What a failure. I set out to fix that particular portion of the problem and to do something instead of providing uh, political action, provide political cover. And I had a concept and it was called Why Does the Klamath Matter? And the reason, the answer why the Klamath matters is not about the Klamath River at all. Along the Klamath River you can find everything that is right and everything that is wrong with our country. The Klamath River represents who we all are as Americans. How do you tell that story? For the last three years, finishing Wednesday of last week, we created a very unusual documentary in which we, three years of working on it, two years of shooting it, uh, the direction was always make this matter in Iowa. Make this matter to somebody who rides a subway to work. If you can do that, we've reached beyond anything that's partisan. We've reached beyond anything that's environmental. We've reached beyond anything that is educational. And in order to do that, we found what I believe is the next course of conservation for this century, which is not about endangered species at all. It's about endangered habitat. And what's unique about habitat is in all the Klamath and the KBRA, habitat includes community. And that has never been done before. Talking about Republicans not supporting, in 2009 I was the only Republican that supported a piece of legislation. And let me put that, that legislation in perspective. We have less than 4 million people that live in our humble state and less than half of them are in the Pacific Core region. And with less than half of them in the Pacific Core region, we have nearly raised our commitment of $200 million. And we only have one dam. And it's the last one to be taken out. The state of California, the fifth largest economy in the world, hasn't come up with a dollar yet. That's very frustrating. When Schwarzenegger, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger and our governor at the time, Lagasse, signed the legislation, uh, very touching to me personally, they handed the pens to my son, who was there wearing a clip-on tie, his mother bought it for him. And the deal was done, but as you know, that bond failed. I'm optimistic that your bond, Prop 1, fails. But the first point of action that I would like to, to ask of the California Commission is, if it doesn't pass, ask your governor 
to line item one dollar with the word Klamath into the next puzzle. And you all know what I'm talking about politically. Just put one dollar in. As so many of us have worked on the East Coast and so many of us have worked around the country on this issue, the, co the constant thing that comes back is why should the federal government <coughs> bail out the state of California? And I say, hey, I'm from rural Oregon. We're in. So I say that very respectfully. And I, I would hope that that message can get delivered. Every one of you are in this public service, not getting paid, for two reasons. One is, you had a time in your life where you wanted to give back, you wanted to serve, and you were interested in fish and animals and the people that catch them and shoot them, right? That's why we all went into fish and wildlife. But in the back of your mind, maybe you didn't articulate it before you in the back of your mind, every one of you wanted to do something big. This is your chance. And as Vice Chair Finley said, it's, it could go at any moment. One of the problems with legislation facing the KBRA is that if, if, if the legislation changes in, in any way in the House, which our congressman in this district swore what happened uh, just last week, we have such an entire balance of 46 organizations who gave their heart and soul. Imagine we took two years to get two commissions together, try doing that 46 groups in two states with a lot of hot politics. This is the oldest water war in America. This is the old one. Nothing longer has been going on since us. And you're right, Commission. It was promised in 1918 that the Tribetown River would receive electricity, and today we don't have it. So, where do things sit right now? Where things sit right now is I have always believed that 2015 would be the year where we get all this done. The film has been uh, created, the film, the film has been renamed from Why Does Climate Matter to something far bigger, far more uh, national, which is called A River Between Us. And that will be released next year. But behind all of that, and largely with the blessing of the TRCP that Mr. Finley uh, has mentioned and then certainly President Sutton is involved with, there is a real opportunity. So my second request to all of you on the commission is this. Please do one thing for us. Speak with one voice. Sign joint letters and make joint calls on one thing that is a simple message. It's so easy to get lost in the, in the muck in this thing. It's so easy to get hung up in the politics. It's, it's really easy to talk to the choir. The only two words that I think that the commission should speak jointly are finish and plan. Finish it. The only thing that's stopping the Klamath from being complete is a lack of leadership. And I know that where the heart of this these two commissions are, use it. And with that, I'd be delighted to answer any questions. Thank you, Jason. Commissioners, on the other side, any questions or comments? Um, I can tell you from my side, we would all gladly do a letter. Um, I'm sure, or I think there's not a problem signing a letter. Same, same here. I think one of the things you said, Jason, resonated with me, and that is the climate is it's the biggest conservation challenge and project in U.S. history that is almost unknown by the public. Part of the reason is that the climate is so remote from the metropolitan areas. It's not near San Francisco. It's not near Portland. It's not near Los Angeles. It, it, it's, it's out of sight, out of mind. And you know, we've seen that for years in ocean conservation lives there and so forth. Um, it's always been a frustration to me, having worked on the planet for more than a decade, that this opportunity, this hugely important project is so little known and gets so little uh, bandwidth in Washington and you know, the political environment. It should get more. Um, one of the things that we're proud of here on the West Coast is that we can still get things done. We can pass legislation. We can get it signed. 
we can make progress. One of the reasons I turned down a job with the Obama administration to stay in California was that we can do things. We can pass legislation. We can uh, get a lot done. And we can get a lot done with our partners in Oregon and Washington. Our three governors came together, remember last year this time, with the Premier of British Columbia to sign a, a groundbreaking agreement on climate and energy in, in San Francisco. They're going to create things that we would we haven't seen in the rest of the nation, like a regional carbon market. Um, surely we can take advantage of that momentum, that progressive partnership to get the climate done. I am completely with you, and we would be happy to sign on to a letter to that effect. Thank you very much, Mr. Rogers. It's my turn to say that someone made me think. Um, I joined the Fish and Game Commission, uh, as I said, about 10 years ago. And I did so to do that big thing about which you were speaking, which is the installation of green light protection. We accomplished the world's largest uh, ecosystem based, interconnected system of marine reserves, and we just got that done. And that was, I was chairman of, of, of Green Resources for three years, and I joined me as co-chair. And I think that that is the most important thing I've ever done in my life. And I'm immensely glad that I'm going to go to my grave having accomplished it, genuinely accomplished it. My CV is, is not that bad. You're, this is a very interesting idea. Because I agree with you. Having been on this commission for 10 years, I've heard almost nothing about the climate. Mm -hmm. I agree with you that this is a matter of leadership. And I also agree with you that this is a very, very big thing to accomplish. Um, you're invigorating. Um, I'm very interested. Thank you. Jerry, uh, maybe the president, so I'll uh, just uh, respond to a couple things. If you, if you look at the greatest moments in American history, I, I'm a historian trained uh, where I fell on my head and went into politics. But if you, look at, if you look at the greatest moments in American history, if you look at the profiles and courage type of moments, they are always when people led their government. Their government didn't lead them. And we're in a situation on the Klamath River where a series of bad decisions by the federal government, no one's point, I'm not pointing fingers, but the, the series of circumstances have led to four generations. Here's interesting, my son is the, is the fifth. Do you know there's no sixth generation on the Klamath River that's my color skin? And you know that these tribes are some of the few tribes in America who are still exactly where they started from time of memorial. They haven't been, no one's rounded up, no one's moved to Oklahoma. There's been no trail of tears, they're still there. And here's a time when people had to get over what they were raised in, multi-generations raised in, and get ahead of the politicians for the first time and figure it out themselves. I used to tell people, people, uh, I, I've kept my project very quiet for a variety of reasons. Um, but people ask me, what, what excites you? Why, why do you keep doing this? And, I, and I, the historian comes up to me because I say, these are the kind of people you want to build a whole country around. Yeah, the rough around the edges. Sure. So are the good ones. These, this is the very best you have in all of the country. It's in a place that no one's ever heard of. I'm waiting for the tears, because they're close. Thank you, Jim. Which is it? Kristen. Kristen, it's great to finally meet you. I've known your dad for many years. I uh, was just giving him a hard time for not being here today, uh, but I'm, I know he's on a river somewhere in Canada catching giant steelhead. So more power to him, but thank you for coming and talking to us today. Uh, 
Well, for the record, my name is Kristen Lambert. I'm the director of water programs for the Climate Basin Rangeland Trust, which is a small nonprofit located um, in the upper Klamath Lake watershed. And uh, President Sutton, thank you so much for your remarks. It's um, a great pleasure that he's out fishing, and perhaps I have the better opportunity to speak to you instead. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe for your benefit as well. <laughs> Dare I say? Um, I am not the orator that um, Mr. Atkinson is, but instead I'll sit before you and try to inspire you a bit more with um, not only lots of pretty pictures of fish and frogs and mountains, but also with a little bit of grounding of what it takes to actually implement these settlements um, or to implement the conservation that's needed outside of the settlements, down in the communities and on the ground. Um, Um, we're now all familiar with the geography, so I'll try to skip quickly through the topics that Chip already covered. Um, but our organization works primarily on restoring flow and hydrologic connectivity in the streams that are tributaries into Upper Klamath Lake. Um, so this would be considered the off-project area, as well as the um, Klamath Tribes um, Historic Reservation Grounds and Homeland. Um, we're familiar now with the species of the basin, but uh, most particularly we're focused on the two um, listed species of suckers, bull trout, uh, the red band rainbow trout, uh, which is not only uh, listed as sensitive under our state law, but it's also an important sport fisheries for our community, so it has uh, particular import in our community. Um, and then the candidate species spotted frog, which is increasingly getting attention. The mission of our organization, I think, is important. It's to restore and conserve both the quality and quantity of water in the upper climate basin to enhance the natural ecosystem and restore ecosystem processes. But also importantly, is to supply the needed water for downstream agriculture, ranching, native fish, and wildlife populations. And so we see ourselves very much sitting in the context of the basin as a whole, which again is one of the core pieces of the settlement, is each of us recognizing our place within the community and the basin as a whole, and what we need to give in order for the settlements to be successful. Um, we engage in restoration, landowner assistance. Again, these are, um, it's a community of very private landowners that don't necessarily they aren't a part of an irrigation district. They don't have a collective representation. They don't have ways of engaging in a lot of the federal and state assistance programs that can make these changes. And so um, that assistance of facilitating landowners, um, some of whom actually aren't literate in <laughs> bringing these programs onto their properties and facilitating that is, I think, one of the core parts of our mission. With that comes in-stream flow protection, as well as monitoring and research so we can implement adaptive management as we go. Um, I do want to take the opportunity to highlight some of the things that we've done. We've completed the first permanent in-stream transfers of water rights, irrigation water rights, in the Klamath Basin, both on the Sprague River, which is one of the more contentious areas of the Klamath, as well as the largest in the basin on Seven Mile Creek. We've restored 450,000 acre feet of in-stream flow in the 12 years that we've been working to do this. Um, and permanently protected several thousand acres of wetlands, as well as um, begun constructing the first treatment wetlands in the basin to focus on the water quality issues that also are really core and fundamental to the settlement, although not explicitly called out. Um, and we work to remove impediments to fish passage and restore other function. Um, as you all know, lack of industry problem for the water balance of how we get irrigation, but it's also a critical aspect to recovery. With respect to fish passage, habitat connectivity, fish can catch that water in the river in order to get to their spawning habitat. Um, water quality and temperature conditions can be absolutely barriers to passage throughout the upper basin. Um, riparian vegetation is obviously important, as well as geomorphic flows so that we can have the function and substrates that are required for these species. Luckily, Oregon is one of the most progressive states in the, in the West and in the country with our abilities to protect water and stream. Um, our in-stream water law was one of the first passed, um, and it allows a whole cadre of flexible tools from putting in streams part of the season, one season's worth of an irrigation right, to dedicating in-stream in perpetuity all the water right, be it irrigation, storage, municipal, whatever that tool is. Um, a lot of the Western states have similar laws on the books, but what's unique about Oregon is that the programs are actively used and regularly implemented. 
So while several Western states theoretically you can protect water and stream, no one is doing it, and the barriers to actually accomplishing that are greater. Um, and I would dare to say that California falls somewhere in the middle of that, where we're just seeing the first successful 1707 protections and dedications of in-stream water in the Scott and the Shasta Basin, which is important um, to recognize as part of the basin as well. Um, speaking again about um, the process and driving you down, kicking and streaming into the details, but actually retiring 30,000 acre feet of water as the settlement requires in a community of disparate private landowners that don't really have a clear regulatory reason that they have to participate is certainly a challenge and it's an administrative hurdle. And what I think is really beautiful about the settlement is that the carrots and the sticks in it are so compelling to the community that you end up in a place where someone can get through. I won't bore you with the steps in it. But everything from going through the partnership development between the state, federal, and private landowners, the adjacent neighbors, if you change what you do with your irrigation water, it impacts the other neighbor on the canal that maybe is opposed to the settlement. And you have to work through that process and the potential legal protests that come with it. How do we value these water rights? Because again, this program is a voluntary program. And we look at valuing very senior, very wet water rights versus relatively junior paper water rights. And how does the settlement We'll roll out onto the ground to do that while being mindful of public funds and public money. Um, so these are some of the challenges that we face and have been working through. Um, but I, what I think is important is the amount of that work that's already been done in the Upper Basin, and I hope to inspire you with the possibility of actually doing this. Um, this is just our organization's work since about 2002. And what you see are all the red bars. Don't worry, too much about the detail on this. But those red bars all represent single year, one year temporary and stream leases. When you move to the right side, and I'm sorry, my gears dropped off, that's up 2014 and 2015, but the green and purple bars are permanent flow dedications of in stream water. Um, so that transition has happened, where landowners sit on the heels of the water crisis in 2001 and 2002, and I was walking out onto these farms talking to people saying, hey, would you like to sell or lease some of your irrigation water to help fish? Those were really difficult discussions to have on a number of fronts. And what you see here represented is that the community has gotten comfortable with that. The fear about talking about water rights and changing operations and the huge responsibility that comes with operating third and fourth generation family ranches, the thinking of that has started to shift to this is in the interest of preserving my family's legacy and my family's history. Doing these types of water transactions is essential to my grandchildren continuing to ranch here. And that's represented by the shifts that you see. It's also represented by the ongoing massive investments that the state of Oregon and the federal government have made to acquire those water rights on a permanent basis. They are real property owned by individual people. And the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, um, as well as some work that I'll highlight done by both Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and California Fish and Wildlife, have helped facilitate bringing in some of the federal dollars to complete that work. Um, within a comprehensive agreement, it's also easy to get lost in, well, we need 30,000 acre feet of water. Every acre foot of water does not have the equivalent result um, when you do it. And so the prioritization and the process of looking at which water is going to be most successful, which water that retirements will do the best job of preserving the social and economic stability of the community, both for the landowners and for the historic fisheries and tribal treaty rights that the tribes have, is a really important part of that. And that can only happen, once again, within this context of partnership that's been built through the settlement process. And so I think that the chance of success, again, goes beyond just trying to bring the legislative piece to bear, but the success of how those partners actually implement this on the ground, so that when we reach the end of this, assuming legislation passes or some other mechanism, we've actually achieved the results that we're looking to achieve. It doesn't matter if we get to the end of it and we've removed the dams, but we don't have a salmon run restored. And so this process of how we actually get this on the ground bring the private public and the private citizens to bear to do each of their individual parts to make it successful is also at the heart of it and why this grassroots effort is the way to make it successful as opposed to something coming down from up above. Um, so just to highlight that, I wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of the projects that we've done so you can see what it looks like on the ground. Um, this is a map you can see Upper Klamath Lake here in Agency Lake. 
Um, and you can see some of the bold lines there. Those are the few areas that we have remaining bull trout populations at the time of listing. Essentially, they're isolated in headwater reaches, primarily due to irrigation diversions that have dewatered the rivers down below that, as well as some private storage facilities and water quality impediments. Um, historically, bull trout ranged throughout this area and migrated down into the lake for feeding so they could exhibit their fluvial life phase. If you're familiar with the bull trout, they're incredible predatory fish that are really magnificent. The bull trout that we have in the basin today are, you know, about this big and not particularly threatening or ominous when you look at them. Um, so this type of settlement program gives us the opportunity to sort of put on steroids the type of restoration that we've already been engaged in which is focusing on each of these areas where we do have remnant populations coming out of Crater Lake National Park on Sun Creek and a couple of the small tributaries in the Wood River Valley and the very upper reaches of the Sprague River on the tributaries to the North Fork and South Fork of the Sprague in a very remote part of the basin. Um, what we focus on are barriers that look like this. This is the upper Seven Mile Creek Diversion Ditch. Um, River Mile 17 up above Upper Klamath Lake it serviced a modest 1,800 acres of irrigated pasture land, but dewatered two miles of the most prime spawning habitat in that entire valley for a variety of species. It's the right gradient, the right temperature, all of those conditions, and within the National Forest Service boundaries. So this diversion is a private diversion. It's located on Forest Service ground, but predates the formation of the Forest Service. We worked, here you can see the river coming out of the wilderness area, the Sky Lakes wilderness area coming down. This is the reach that had been dewatered before it goes out to irrigate two ranches. This is a fabulous voluntary project where one of the two ranchers on this diversion agreed to first lease and ultimately we have just completed the first permanent in-stream transfer of this magnitude in the basin. It's 17 cubic feet per second, um, which for those of you familiar, that's a sizable volume of water. And we'll continue to service the adjacent landowner who's not interested in participating in the program. Um, but this is the scale of work. Flow restoration alone in rewatering that reach isn't sufficient. It takes a comprehensive and focused approach. So we've worked to um, address nine of the 10 remaining barriers to passage that happen below that, as well as on the tributaries. So those are um, undersized culverts, push-up dams, other types of impediments, um, with the final piece ultimately needing to be the breaching of some of the dikes and levees around the lake to restore the natural wetland habitat that's there. Um, the long canal that sits here, well, there's no physical impediment, certainly a water quality impediment and a predatory impediment, impediment for birds um, to be able to just pick their shot while they sit there in the canal. Um, but this is the type of comprehensive approach that it takes to actually rolling this down into the system. And when you look at this effort, that's nine different landowners coming together and agreeing to work together. What I particularly like about this project and why I wanted to highlight it are, is also the number of partners that were involved. Um, a unique part of the size of this is the price tag of buying that scale of water right. And the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and California Fish and Wildlife um, both sponsored together a package to change one of the federal programs under ESA Section 6, which typically funds conservation easements or land acquisitions to protect endangered species. For the first time, that fund was used to acquire water, recognizing that water and holding an easement over that water is an essential part of species recovery as well. And so we were able to bring $1 million of Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, ESA funding um, to the program, primarily because the two states cooperated in supporting that application. And by having bi-state support for those proposals, the set ranking process bumps you up to the top of that. And so again, the importance of although we're managing a small tributary, as you see in the very upper reaches of the basin, that bi-state support is essential to actually get in that water then into the basin. And this represents um, about 1,500 acre feet of the 30,000 acre feet that we need. So it's not insignificant. That's a serious chunk that's already been accomplished for it. Um, similar projects where we have, this is one that uh, will be the next proposal for that same funding stream, where you have a series of riparian water rights for irrigation of pasture as well as a privately operated storage reservoir, or similarly, you have, um, in this case, seven miles of stream dewatered throughout most of the um, migratory cycle for bull trout and red band rainbows, as well as water quality impediments to the suckers and the main stem of the Sprague River. 
And this type of action on the ground, the landowner has not only agreed to transfer permanently and dedicate those water rights in the stream, but voluntarily change operation of the private reservoir without any funding to maintain bypass flow on a year-round basis, essentially giving up about 15% of his storage in that reservoir, again, as a voluntary piece to accomplish this type of settlement implementation. Um, I won't go through details. I guess that one, it's also worthy of noting, is 1,600 acre feet of in-stream flow. So again, sizing the contributions towards this 30,000 acre foot target that we have. Um, and perhaps the most exciting piece is the partnership that we have with Crater Lake National Park um, for bull trout recovery. Again, all of these projects are for, from our bull trout focused effort. Um, the National Park had a effort to put permanent barrier semi-permanent barriers in place to eliminate brook trout, the biggest competitor for bull trout, and they were able to bring the population, I think it was down, in the numbers in front of me, to around 60 individuals, and the last survey we had over 4,000 individuals three years later. Those fish are now making it down into the private ranch, they've been living in habitat like this, and this is what they encounter as they migrate down and try to exhibit the fluvial part of their life phase. So once again, a partnership between Oregon Department of Forestry, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, who's been a huge um, piece of the design work, and the work that the National Park has done, and most importantly, two private landowners agreeing to reconstruct the historic channel, reconnect the river to its historic influence, the Wood River, um, and allow the fish to once again exhibit that alluvial life phase, and hopefully repopulate some of the territory in the where they've been extirpated. Um, so that's what this implementation looks like on the ground. I did want to briefly highlight, I asked for the Nature Conservancy to send me a slide of the work they've done in just an in interest of time. I won't, um, sorry about that, belabor it. But um, in the Shasta River watershed, they completed some of the um, most recent and first 1707 petitions to dedicate and permanently protect water in the stream in the Shasta River. Um, interestingly, in California, you have the opportunity to add a type of use to your water right. So in their case, they've not given up the ability to use those water rights for irrigation, but added in-stream use as another beneficial use to the water right that they can utilize as needed to move fish through the system in times of drought um, or, or other needs for water quality and temperature control in that area. Um, so it's really exciting. I think that was a six-year process for them to accomplish it. I believe they received 150 comments and protests to their initial application, which they were able to work through and have entire consensus around those transfers. So I think it's important to highlight magnitude of water and flow protection happening in Oregon as well as in California. Um, the Scott River also has a Scott River Water Trust, I'm sorry I don't have a slide to represent their work, but they've been engaged also in a, a challenging community to do that work with some important success, a very focused short duration in-stream transfers, specifically trying to move fish where they need to go for a three-week period, um, which is also an incredible way to merge the needs of agriculture with the ecosystem. And then I'd like to look somewhat beyond the KBRA and the water settlement. All of this work needs to continue, um, regardless of the legislation passing, and the work needs to continue beyond what's necessary in the legislation. And as we develop these water market tools, we have the opportunity to move water throughout the basin based on what the market needs are, be it additional water to the refuges beyond what the deliveries will be, or to support irrigated agriculture in parts of the lower basin. Um, the opportunity to have markets deliver water from lower value agriculture to higher value agriculture, or whatever the community deems as the value of it. These water markets are emerging and having the settlement develop and um, accelerate the process of that is very exciting. Um, and the final piece I want to emphasize, um, I, I won't bore you too much into details, but is the water quality component to this flow restoration, which is somewhat lost, I think, in the settlement, but I believe is equally important given the water quality issues that we have. Um, and what you're looking at here is um, an extended look at all of the different tributaries into Upper Klamath Lake and what happens when flow increases and you see a statistically significant drop in the concentration of phosphorus. So the direct linkage between um, leaving water in stream and keeping that cold spring water clean. So only diverting the pieces that we really need to use at the time that we really need to use it and a huge benefit that we see that is then filtered down through some of the algal blooms that we're experiencing both in Upper Klamath Lake and the hydroelectric reservoirs as internal challenges. 
Um, so finally, I just want to thank the communities and the landowners that we work with, because again, all of the flow restoration, every one of these projects is done on a voluntary basis with a private landowner who chooses to support this with their family's operation. Almost entirely third and fourth generation privately operated in the family farm. And so if that's not a demonstration of the importance of the settlement to the community, I, I don't know what is. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Christy. Commissioners, any questions? We'll start with California. Commissioner Rogers. Well, I don't have a question, but I, I, I take exception actually to something that you said initially. Uh, you apologized to us for your comparative eloquence uh, to the <laughs> senator. Um, I don't think you need to apologize to anyone. <laughs> Point well taken. I totally agree. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, very interesting. You know, it's easy to talk about river restoration in generality, but this is where the rubber meets the road. And I appreciate your all your efforts and the efforts of your staff and your partners and so forth. These voluntary programs are really interesting. One question. Um, I recently talked with uh, folks at the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation in Portland that have a water transactions office largely funded by EPA and focused on, you know, initially on the Columbia River system. However, one of the things they said to us is that they're interested in expanding their work to the planet, and they're working also in California and Nevada and so forth. Um, the staff of Blair probably knows about what they're doing in the East Coast of the Sierras, for example. But, I wonder if, if that, you know, the National Foundation recently, or, or just hired a Pacific Regional Director based in San Francisco. They want to expand what they're doing along the Pacific uh, states. Is that a potential source for funding with these sorts of transactions? Um, it already is. Um, I can't emphasize enough, actually, the role that NIFWIF has played in a lot of the flow restoration work in the planet. Um, the vast majority of funding for the transactions we've completed has been close to a 50-50 share between the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, primarily, they have a Keystone Initiative focused in the Klamath, or the Upper Klamath, as well as the Lower Klamath Keystone Initiative. And they're funding through the Bring Back the Natives program, which is able to pool funding at the different federal agencies together to hit different priorities that they have. So. Um, they also play, I think, a really beneficial role when you're trying to move funds for things like this out to these rural, less connected areas. Again, we're a tiny nonprofit for staff, not all of us full time. Um, when there's leftover dollars at the end of a budget cycle in the federal government, we're certainly not in a position to take advantage of getting those on the ground in the planet. And so organizations and entities like NIFWIF are a really important facilitator of accomplishing some of those objectives. So I am familiar with and very energized about their Water in the West program and would encourage support um, for that effort. Thank you. Any more questions for California? Not a question, but just to offer one additional piece of information. Within the $7.5 billion water bond is, in California, an allocation, if approved, of $200 million what's called our Wildlife Conservation Board, which I chair and Mr. Sutton sits on. It's California's primary kind of conservation acquisition entity. And that money would be used for enhanced stream flow projects. Enhanced stream flow projects are kind of defined as reservoir reoperation and ag efficiency, but also acquisition and leasing. Thank you, Madam Chair. For, for you members of the California Commission, uh, I don't want to get too personal with uh, our, 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 our witness, but uh, we're very fortunate she's here. Um, I've known, I went to kindergarten with her father. You're and, really. And uh, <laughs> I've watched uh, her grow up, not to embarrass you, because you're, you're on that. You love to but, embarrass but, you, but, uh, but we are fortunate <laughs> okay. that she did the presentation today. Yeah. And I mean that at all. Very well done and uh, very likely to see. I have a question. Uh, I used to fish Seven Mile Creek quite a bit in my younger days. Was there recognition of, and actually it's two parts. Um, the landowner on Seven Mile Creek, Creek that decided to cooperate and so forth. Uh, did you get any other recognition regionally or from the governor or from the commission? Or would that be unhelpful? 
to get that kind of recognition. I, this is the landowner and his son. It's James and Jimmy Hobson, um, just to give it a personal context. And no, he hasn't, and I think it would be incredibly beneficial. Um, it was so interesting to work with, and that project started, if I can use a few minutes of your time, with a fence. Um, in 2003, I went and met with him and said, you know, this creek has incredible potential. Could we put a riparian fence up? You don't have to exclude grazing, but you can manage your riparian <coughs> grazing that way and just sort of flash graze it during appropriate times and otherwise maintain the exclusion. And that fence that we built has led to, I believe it to be the largest ecologic in-stream dedication of water um, that I think the state has had. I apologize if I'm misspeaking, but that's my understanding of it. Um, and so I think it would be an incredible honor. One other really unique part of this project is that not only was the funding, um, the creative funding that came through the ESA program, thanks to um, both states, but the students at Southern Oregon University voted to offset 100% of their on-campus water use for five years with a voluntary additional fee on their um, enrollment costs. Every time they sign up for a class, they pay two dollars extra for every single uh, credit that they get. And during that time, they're paying for 7% of this in-stream transaction. It's offsetting all the dorm water, their on-campus irrigation, student union, all of that. And the, the sort of nexus to it is that this stream actually, historically, this stream system is a version that does go over the road basin, which um, ultimately services the campus. Um, so I think there's some really unique pieces. And although Seven Mile is a relatively small creek, it does have this history within the community. Um, but one of the most powerful pieces was sitting with Jim and him talking about fishing on the creek with his grandpa and how he couldn't go fishing with his grandson in the same places because the fish weren't there anymore. And how he said over time, I didn't realize what I had lost. And now that I'm watching fish swim by where I used to fish, and we just go watch them, he said with his grandson. We don't fish, we just go watch them. And um, that powerful image of him realizing what he as one individual was able to do was very inspirational for me. So. Um, so, I, I recognize that value, uh, and I think we could probably work with the commission and the governor's office or something for recognition. Would that be, would the media that would accompany that in the recognition help the other person on Seven Mile Creek, or would that be neutral, or would that be seen as a I think it needs to be neutral. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. I just want to thank Kristen for the presentation. Uh, I worked with Kristen, uh, as you all probably know, Section 6 grants only agencies can apply for those federal grants. And so we both were in Park Fish Island. We applied for the grant on the behalf of the Climate Basic Arrangement Trust. And uh, I think Kristen got a little education in the political process. <laughs> at least in Oregon, as it relates to state agencies applying for federal grants, and we had to do the dance a little bit, but we, we legislated work with the department, and we finally got that through. And you know, it, was, it was a meaningful, a meaningful project. So, and I think state, former state senator Atkinson deserves a huge piece of the credit for pushing that ultimately through as well. So, thank you for that. Thanks, Kristen. Thank you. Oh, wait a second. One more question from President. Well, Sorry. I was just saying that your, your uh, example of the students voluntarily helping pay for uh, stream water. Our uh, staff director at the commission is a, is a uh, alum of UC Davis. If all of their students pay, we could we could restore the entire Sacramento Valley. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much, Kristen. It's very wonderful. Um, we're going to take a 15 minute break. And we will be back at 11 35. Oregon commissioners, please wait for a minute. Enrique Sanchez is going to come up and introduce himself to us. He is the gentleman who is our executive recruiter for the new director. Since we have not met him.
Salmon Center. We're an international salmon conservation organization that works across the Pacific Rim on wild salmon conservation. Uh, you know me from previous uh, testimony. Um, the, having both commissions here today is an unusual opportunity for us to look at regional solutions and ways to kind of learn from each other. And I'm testifying today in a more of an accelerated way than I planned to describe a big idea that is gaining traction in Washington, Oregon, and hopefully California, that is a strategy that we must adopt as a region if we're gonna deal with the kind of stressors that we saw from Dr. Peterson's presentation. And the idea and the strategy is establishing wild fish zones, areas that are managed explicitly for wild salmon and steelhead at the basin level or at the sub-basin level throughout the region to capture our most important centers of wild salmon abundance and diversity. Our system is uh, roughly split between hatchery production and wild fish production. The hatchery system is important. We've got it, it's not going anywhere, but it does not generate the kind of genetic and live fishery diversity that our fish need to adapt to a changing environment. In the next 50 years, we're gonna see a lot of changes. And we saw a preview of that just now. Climate change, more and more droughts happening in California. And so what we need to do as stewards of these fish, right, to bring them forward to the next generation is build a portfolio, a resilient portfolio of populations, hatchery and wild, that can navigate and adapt to this changing world. Those wild fish are not a monolith. They're hundreds of little populations. Some come early, some come late. They have the ability to adapt, right? And so this concept is gaining traction. Washington's created three in southwest Washington, wild fish zones for steelhead, also called sanctuaries. Uh, Peter Moyle has testified to the need for this in California as well. I know you know that Oregon just made a tremendous step designating 19 watersheds on the Oregon coast as wild fish zones. I'm asking this commission, both commissions, to consider expanding this work 
and anchoring each region with wildfish management zones to balance our hatchery system and to provide nodes of genetic and life history diversity so that we can manage the kind of changes we're going through. Now, there is a myriad of plans and recovery plans and processes, and the entry points are going to be difficult. And the only way to get this done is to ask our agencies to come up with a plan to do it and to begin the process. This doesn't mean this shouldn't affect harvest. This doesn't mean dismantling our hatchery system, but it's asking our agencies to come up with a regional plan to establish wild fish zones in each area so that we have our seed corn and the ability to, to respond. Um, a, a prime example of this would be the Klamath. If the dam issues resolved, the Klamath River above the Trinity will be a perfect example of where we can have a wild fish zone to provide the best hatchery in the world is a healthy river and it and it's, produces fish forever and the kind of fish that can survive the gauntlet. So uh, I'd like to leave the commission with um, this idea, I'd like to, this is a moment that we need leadership. I think the political will is there. I think this is something that can be done. But if we don't do this, incrementally, the hatchery system keeps expanding. Now on the Columbia Basin, they're proposing a whole new hatchery program on top of the last remaining healthy wild fall Chinook populations in the Columbia. So we're at a moment of time. We're not like Washington State that has hatchery programs on every single major river. Oregon and California are different. Even in systems like the Columbia and the Sacramento and the Klamath, we've got to make management goals of establishing nodes of wild fish diversity and abundance. If we turn the corner and go to full industrial domestication of places like the Sacramento, we're going to continue to see those wild swings that are the symptom of a lack of genetic diversity. So uh, that's my, my ask. I appreciate the, the moment to speak to you. Thank you. Nice picture, Gato. Hi, <laughs> Scott. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Chair Levy, Chair yeah, Sutton. I'm sorry, Madam yeah. Chair. Can we, uh, I know... Uh, no, you don't ask we questions. Have a question. you, know. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to stay to you and say no questions, or do you want to do a question? I, I'm, I'm hoping for a question. Oh, okay, okay. All right, questions. All Thank you. Time. Thank you, Guido. Um, I'm really glad that Sonki is here. My... Uh, fellow Commissioner Richard Rogers, who co-chairs the Marine Advisory to the Marine uh, Committee at the Commission. Also Stafford Lair, the head of the Fisheries Branch here from California. We, we, in California, we have wild fish zones already for trout, wild, wild trout waters. To my knowledge, we don't designate wild fish zones for salmon and steelhead, or maybe we do. Sonki, can you remind us what we do in California? We don't have designated wild areas. We have areas where we don't stock any salmon, etc. So by default we have wild areas, but they're not designated. Uh, the only designations for wild and heritage trout. Right. That's what I thought. So what Gita's proposing, as I understand it, is wild fish zones for salmon and steelhead where we would have no hatchery fish commingling. Uh, and we would, seg we would segregate, keep the wild fish wild. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, and, and really the low fruit are places where you don't have any hatchery programs now, but you don't want to have one in the future, and you want to build local support and recognition of those wild fish. But it also means increase, reducing the impact of hatchery on wild fish in those places also. The whole idea is to get a portfolio, right, a resilient portfolio for the next 100 years. Um, it, it, we, uh, one of the things I think is very, uh, first of all, I love everything you guys do. You know, my classmate Peter uh, Sovereld was, uh, my classmate at the Naval Academy was, was uh, your founder. Yeah, founder. Yeah. Actually, his brother designed a couple of boats. I sailed was the But in any event, um, one of the things that is always, uh, I'm very much in favor of what you guys are doing, but one of the things that's always disturbed me uh, when it came to wild versus hatchery is that often there's a denigration of the hatchery implicit within that, not necessarily with respect to the, what you guys do, but as you know, we've been fighting a number of folks who don't think our hatchery operations are appropriate for a, a number of reasons. Just yesterday, we toured a hatchery operation in Shasta, which is responsible right now for saving an entire population of wild trout because of the drought. 
Were it not for these facilities and our, and our expertise in running hatchery facilities, those trout would probably be dead by now, literally, because the rest of their reaches are dried up completely. I think it's, I think it's important in, when we talk about what you do, which is so very important, that there is not a negative side to hatcheries per se, mm -hmm. but the genetic, di a positive commentary about the genetic diversity that non-hatchery represents. I think it's very important for that because our hatchery operations literally right now in this drought are saving our butts. Yeah, no, I think you said it just right. It's a matter of balancing our portfolio and we need our hatchery system and it's important. Great. Yeah. Commissioners, Commissioner Finley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, portfolio, do you believe that uh, we have either the genetics or the studies? Uh, do we have, do, have you identified or do we have species of wild salmon and or steelhead? Because we're challenging the Umpqua River with warm water uh, in the Umpqua that are noted or have been observed uh, in these warming waters that, that, that actually uh, in their ancestral past may have run into this. You know, I remember an article I read where the Alcalde of Los Angeles in like the 1600s uh, prohibited salmon fishing above such and such street. So at that point, the Los Angeles River had salmon. And so obviously, that river may or may not have been warm. We probably lost those genetics, but you get the point. Mm -hmm. Have we identified any of those types of fish? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Are you asking, have we identified fish that are adapting to climate change? Yes. Yeah, in Oregon, on the Oregon coast, we've got fall Chinook showing up in February and uh, January, February, now March. And so what you get is, in the natural system, a spectrum of life histories, and when the environment changes, they had the chance to, to jump in. So they may have been the tail ends of the curve from a temporal standpoint, and now they're the middle of the curve. So that's one of our best strategies to, to deal with this. Give those fish a chance to adapt. You need habitat and you need wild fish. And the regions that you're talking about, I think you referenced that each region will build uh, or identify all you know, uh, zones for specific fish for your wild or a combination or not. Right, so each, so this has already been done on the Oregon coast. They've got 19 sites located. It's been done in southwest Washington for steelhead. And we need to look at each region and decide which tributaries or which places we're gonna make sure that we're reaching our conservation goals for wild fish. And those are the sanctuaries or wild fish management zones. And it's not an attack on the hatchery system. It's a way to make sure that we're sustaining the resilience across the spectrum and giving wild fish a chance to survive. Okay, so when I angle, we do 100% uh, mass marking by removing the platypus fin of hatchery fish, which is, I think, effective in terms of identifying the fish while it's still in the water, whether it's a hatchery fish and can be kept, or whether it's a wild fish and should be released. I don't know. Commissioner Sutton, what does, does California have a similar uh, marking program? Stafford, where's Stafford? Where's Sankey? We do, I, I believe in California we mark all steelhead, but we do not mark all salmon. It's actually been an issue that uh, our stakeholders have raised. We had a bill uh, in front of the legislature which did not uh, pass this year that would have required the marking of all salmon, all hatchery salmon, which is of course uh, astronomically expensive, and that's the reason the legislature didn't adopt the bill. But Sonky. Yeah, and there's a there's frankly another issue is uh, a lot of the fishing community in California is actually scared of a mark select fishery that a full marking program might allow because we have listed salmon, and right now it's managed through a surrogate or proxy. Um, if you had a mark select fishery, it the uncertainty of what that would do is causing that industry to kind of say, whoa, we're not sure we want to go there yet. So, plus the expense. And also, not just to marking, but on the scientific side, 
when you do data collection, having them all marked, it drives the cost and the volume of fish you have to look at way to the roof. And the question, of course, who pays for it. So that's been kind of impediment to that. So o Oregon and uh, Washington have a policy of 100% marking. And, and the more fish you mark, the more you can implement selective fisheries because you know what and what fish to keep, but it is expensive. Commissioner Woolley, any questions? Commissioner Anderson, ever? Thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead, Scott. Thank you, Chair Levy, Chair Sutton, members of the two the commissioners. President. President. My, President. Uh, my mistake. <laughs> Great leader will be. Mr. President. <laughs> Mr. President, Chair Levy, <laughs> members of the commissions. Uh, for the record, my name is Scott Beckstead. I'm the Senior Oregon Director. Uh, I'm the Western Regional Director for the Humane Society of the United States. As Western Regional Director, I oversee uh, state directors in uh, 12 Western states, including uh, California. So it's uh, a real treat for me to be able to see two states get together like this uh, to talk about wildlife. The Humane Society of the United States considers the lead of wildlife to be a major animal welfare problem across the nation and we strongly support uh, programs and legislation to eliminate lead ammunition uh, in hunting. Uh, so we, uh, as an organization, we strongly appreciate the, the leadership that was shown by California in being proactive by uh, implementing a, a phase out of lead ammunition in hunting. And uh, it probably goes without saying that we uh, are very hopeful that uh, Oregon will, will follow that lead. And uh, specifically that uh, you as a commission will uh, take the proactive step of protecting Oregon wildlife from lead poisoning uh, and the risk of lead poisoning presented by lead ammunition used in hunting. We know and we have known for many decades that lead is highly toxic. We also know, uh, largely anecdotally, that wildlife in Oregon is being poisoned by lead ammunition that is being discharged uh, in hunting activities. Um, and we also know that the elimination of lead ammunition in hunting waterfowl uh, has uh, achieved uh, remarkable results in eliminating uh, lead poisoning from migratory waterfowl. And, and when the elimination of lead ammunition in waterfowl hunting was first proposed, it was met with a lot of the same, it was received by a lot of the same uh, response that we're, um, that we're hearing today on, on lead ammunition generally. Uh, and yet uh, those who are um, proponents of waterfowl conservation cannot deny the benefits of, of that important step. We know that Southern Oregon is uh, historically uh, the, the native range of the California condor. We know that there is a strong desire here in Oregon at some point to reintroduce the California condor to its native Oregon range, but we also know that that is not a feasible plan until we remove toxic lead ammunition used in hunting from our landscape. So having said that, uh, it is uh, the desire of the Humane Society of the United States and our supporters and followers uh, that the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission would follow California's lead and take the step of eliminating uh, lead ammunition in hunting. And I'm happy to answer any questions. No questions. Commissioners, questions? Thanks very much, Scott. You've waited a long day for no questions. No problem. <laughs> okay, nice to see you. Um, Alan Ayer and Roy and Betty Hall, are you guys coming up together to talk on the same subject? No. Yes, no? No. Okay. Um, if you wait just a second, uh, Commissioner, um, Finley would like to discuss lead ammunition among the two commissioner commissions. So we'll just hold on a second. Okay. Go ahead. I just
just wanted to ask a question while we have uh, three scarred warriors uh, on this issue in California. Maybe a quick just overview, a few bullets of lessons learned. Uh, you know, I know your goals were at Google. Some were addressed by Mr. Beckstead. Um, you did an initiative for California condors and limited the ammunition in, what, seven counties or something. Um, but, you know, just a little overview while we have you for, for all of us sure. about the issue. So, thank you. Uh, Mr. Finley, I'll start and then turn it over to Sonke and Dan Perigary is here in the back who's probably uh, on the bleeding edge, as they say, of the, of, uh, the um, issue in California. But after all they have spoken, we'll get to chop liver here. <laughs> the, uh, uh, Commissioner Rogers, of course, yes. My, uh, the, one of us who's been on the commission since 1840. Um, the, uh, <laughs> 70. Um, the lead, lead ammo issue began in California with um, a bill in 2007 in the legislature. Um, at that time, as you know, uh, we were becoming much more concerned about the California condor. We had spent millions of dollars to bring the species back from the brink of extinction, release them back into the wild, and we were finding they were, they were being poisoned by lead, specifically lead ammunition from carcasses and, and gut piles and so forth left in the field. And they had to be brought back out of the wild, their lead, uh, their blood cleansed for lead. So the legislature passed a bill in 2007 that required we uh, eliminate lead ammunition in the Condor Range, the, the current Condor Range, south of Monterey, north of Los Angeles, basically. And so we did that then. Uh, it became apparent, though, in the next several years that um, condors were still getting poisoned because they're, they don't stay in one place either any more than wolves. They were flying out and eating carcasses elsewhere. And so in 2000, in last year, the legislature expanded its um, desire to eliminate lead from the wildlife food chain uh, by passing AB 711, which is the statute that requires a five-year phase-out of lead ammunition from all hunting. Now, I want to emphasize hunting because the statute does not require the elimination of lead ammunition entirely. If you want to shoot at the range, if you want to shoot uh, cans and bottles and so forth, target practice, you can shoot all the lead you want. But under the bill, lead would be phased out for hunting uh, by 2019. Once the statute was passed, the action shifted to our commission to implement regulations to uh, accomplish the, the goals of the statute. Meanwhile, the Department of Fish and Wildlife acting proactively, and, and uh, Deputy Director Perigary is here, been overseeing this, has been working very diligently to develop a regulatory calendar and schedule for that implementation. They've been holding a series of uh, workshops all around the state to talk to the affected community about how this will happen. and. I think I should let him tell you about that, but they've developed a game plan that we will implement over the next year. We have to, by law, we have to uh, begin the regulatory process by December. Thank you. Uh, again, Dan Perry, California Fish and Wildlife. Um, one of the nuances in the bill that was signed was set a start of a regulatory process, set an end date, but the governor also, the bill also uh, asked for implementation as soon as practicable, which then gave us some challenge at that point to define that as practicable. <clears throat> One of the things for those of you that hunt or shoot, you know that ammunition in, in general right now is in very short supply and the manufacturers are going crazy making money on traditional ammunition. So uh, the commission received uh, their wildlife resources committee uh, last month received some uh, testimony from the National Shooting Sports Foundation that frankly cast doom and gloom on the future of hunting, sales of ammunition, the sales of hunting licenses in California. Um, and the bill was originally introduced called for a phase in by three years. It got amended to five, but we are faced with an enforcement problem. Our law enforcement officers have no way really to detect a uh, copper bullet from a lead bullet. So that technology is under development, but it doesn't exist today. Um, if I personally could have waved, waved the magic wand, I would have looked for a longer implementation time. 
to give us, give the, uh, we just, the timing is really awkward right now with the ammunition as general. But as uh, Commissioner Sutton said, we followed essentially what you all did with your wolf plan. We held about 14 workshops around the state, uh, floated some proposals, took some input from the public as what would be uh, practicable. Our governor's signing message also asked for us to make it as least disruptive as possible to hunters. So trying to find that balance is what we've entered into so far. Uh, we're proposing a set of rulemakings to our commission at their December meeting. Um, what we're, uh, more detailed if you want it. Um, in our first year, um, for our managed hunting areas, we would switch to non-toxic load for all hunting. So even the small areas where we have limited big game hunts and muzzleloader hunts, we're still working our way through that tiny detail. But um, And for our sheep hunters, we've got a very limited sheep hunt in our state right now. The tags are nearly a dozen or so. So that was practicable and we didn't think very disruptive. If you're fortunate enough to draw a sheep tag in our state, you'll probably not mind the extra 30 bucks for a box of bullets or two and sighting that gun in. You'll be quite happy to have them. Um, and uh, the other thing that wasn't mentioned is it's not just hunting, it's the take of wildlife. So folks that are involved in depredation issues are gonna have to switch as well. So we recognize that non-toxic loads for shotguns are widely available and relatively reasonably priced. Not as cheap as lead, we get it, but it's not going to be so disruptive to require it then for large resident game birds in the second year. So if you're after pheasants off site of our wildlife areas or turkeys or chucker or quail, uh, but we're saving like doves for the last year, 2019, because the availability of small size shot. Um, and we've recognized and told the public going in that some calibers of rifles are never going to have a non-toxic load for your use in hunting in California. It's very hard to find 410 gauge or 28 gauge non-toxic shot. We, we just know that, but that was the law that we got, and so we're doing our best to implement it. Thank you, Dan. Uh, let me just add one thing. There is a, a good piece of news here, and that is this is a train to some extent that's already left leaving the station because a, a number of hunters have told us they're switching to, to non-lead ammunition already, even though it's not required, because they consider it's a better round, holistically and, and so forth. So, um, but Dan is right, the, the issue, we are grappling right now with the issue of availability and in what caliber and what places. And availability, by the way, it, we don't define availability as available online in Cabela's or you know, to buy online. We, we tend to define availability as the local hardware store. So that's that's the challenge. And, uh, but there's a lot to think about. This is still a work in progress in California, so we don't have all the answers yet. But I want to just commend the department for being really diligent and uh, taking the brunt of the public uh, discomfort over change. I, I lived through the change to waterfowl, to non-toxic shot for waterfowl 30 years ago, almost 30 years ago. And I was a Fish and Wildlife Service agent at Federal Game Warden. Nobody liked it then. The duck hunters were convinced of the end of duck hunting. It would ruin their firearms. I'll tell you one thing. I don't meet a single duck hunter today that thinks that was a bad idea. Because guess what's happened since then? Duck, hunt, duck Continental waterfowl populations are at all-time highs compared to then. Many cases, most cases, the limit is more than twice. The daily bag limit for waterfowl is more than twice what it was uh, when we implemented the, the non-toxic shot. Now that's not just because we switched to steel shot; it's because we got a lot better at conserving habitat, so forth as well. But um, there is always going to be a resistance to change. We know that change is hard, but sometimes change is in the best interest of our wildlife. There's another element to this um, that that is very important to consider. Um, but it's very uncomfortable for most hunters who hunt big game animals and take them home and feed their families. It's very important, uh, unfortunate and uncomfortable for them to consider. I have seen dozens of x-rays um, with at least 100 to as many as 300 fragments, lead fragments from a lead bullet that went into a deer or an elk, hit a bone and shattered. Those fragments were infinitesimal and yet would have been fed to that hunter's family or whomsoever were, was to, to ingest that. This has actually been studied back east a bit and there are some, some venues that are actually taking action uh, from a public health 
perspective, not a hunting perspective per se. Um, so there were a number of, of sort of cultural resistances. Those who run the cattle know very well that you know there's a culture and people don't like to be told that there's a better way to do something. Well, same thing with hunters. Um, and it's, um, even if you were to, to, which we have done in front of many, many people, demonstrate to them that it, not only is it better ballistics, it's a better health thing, et cetera, this is holding aside the availability and then, and then the enforcement issues of not being able to determine that which is the wet board or not. Uh, people will resist it simply because of what I call studied ignorance. You can have a pile of peer-reviewed papers saying something is great, something is wonderful, something will work. But if someone, if that contradicts some, what someone believes, they're not going to even read those papers. And we've watched this studied ignorance played out in front of us as a commission on a myriad of issues, but in particular, this one. Yeah, the, there was a good question. What did we learn? And I think if there's one, I've been involved with this. Early enough, as a, as a teenager, I participated in the early uh, waterfowl steel load program uh, because it was, they were giving away free boxes of ammo. And in uh, my youth, that was very valuable. Uh, I think the, the, the key advice, if I was to offer it to you and how to proceed, is what Commissioner Rogers was addressing, is you have to deal with the anxiety, the fear, and the uh, perceptions about what people believe it is about, rather than what it is about. And we really struggle when we had the first bill passed, the Condor Ridley Act, the belief by the the constituents was, well, we had to prove that lead was causing it. And if you couldn't prove it, then therefore should we, we should do it. And they were not hearing, as Mr. Uh, Commissioner Rogers was pointing out, they, they were not hearing the, the accumulation of issues. It was not just secondary poisoning of wildlife. It, it was also human issues. Uh, there were beliefs that it wouldn't perform. And so anything you can do to kind of put those fears and anxieties on the table right up in front, deal with them. Uh, there were a lot of efforts to do demos, you know, those who thought their gun wouldn't work with it. You know, they, we, had, we actually had some partnerships that took people out, gave them free, lead free ammo, let them shoot it through their guns. That started breaking down and educating them. Um, I, I have a farm saying uh, with friends from Missouri, you kind of got to show them. And the more you could do that, and tackle that very early on. If you don't do that, you will fight and drag those anchors all the way to the end. And uh, it, it's just about the anxiety. I mean, we're talking about a very traditional practice. A lot of fear right now that it's some secret way to take their guns or get rid of their hunting rights. It's not at all what it's about. And so the advice is deal with that up front as much as you can. I have uh, often thought that Lead and the use of lead ammunition may explain Commissioner Finley's uh, votes on a number of issues. Excessive consumption of lead over the years. <laughs> I have a question. Was the ammunition industry involved uh, leading up to the campaign for legislation? And if, if so, in what way? And how did you work with them? And how have you worked with them since? Uh, yes, Commissioner Dan Perger again. Um, they did come and testify at our legislative hearings, and they did, uh, something I forgot to mention, add something to the conversation that was very important, and that's the uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms ban on armor-piercing bullets. The legislation, the federal legislation that gives them that authority gives the department director or the secretary, I'm not sure which, uh, the authority to exempt certain calibers for sporting purposes. There are something like two dozen or more petitions waiting for that clarity and that's created a lot of uncertainty with the ammunition industry. How can they invest in something that the Bureau may ban? Um, we did uh, try to engage the uh, manufacturers and get them to the table and try and talk with us. Uh, they ended up going through their association, the National Shooting Sports Foundation, who presented to our commissions uh, Wildlife Resources Committee. So we tried to engage. They uh, went through their trade association. Thank you. 
Well, one thing I'd like to em emphasize is, is Dan's comment. Um, I don't know how your legislature works, but our legislature holds a hearing, maybe. You know, a person might have five minutes maximum to, to discuss one side or the other, and then they'll start making decisions. Sometimes you might get a replication of that. With the MLPA, we did tens of thousands of, of man hours of working with, with, with uh, constituent groups. Stakeholders. This issue is one of those that perhaps doesn't require 10,000 hours of stakeholder working, but it, it, it really needs people to be able to explain themselves and explain their fears, and you're not going to do that at a legislative hearing. The department needs to do that, and the commission needs to do that, and hear these people out. People get very angry when they're not heard. So part of what I was getting at is uh, the nature of the relationship. Was it an amical relationship? Was it adversarial? You know, what, what could we look forward to here in Oregon? Well, yeah, I, if you'll excuse me for going back for a second, I didn't complete my own thought. Um, that testimony that uh, the Shooting Sports Foundation provided to our legislature resulted in an amendment to the bill, which gives our director the authority, doesn't give him the authority, it requires the director to exempt any cartridge that BATF declares as ammo piercing. So that kind of took that off the table and was a very valuable change to the legislation. Um, I, we're not talking very much directly to the industry as much as we are their lobbyists and their trade association. And I would tell you it's not particularly friendly. There's a belief that the department's role in the passage of that legislation was not what they would have liked to see. So I'll be brutally frank, they're mad at us. Let me, let me just expand on that for a second because it goes to the politics you can expect to see when, when and if you decide to take this issue on. Last year there were about two dozen gun and firearm and ammunition bills before the California legislature. Some of them, most of them passed. The governor vetoed about half of them. He signed the other half, all on the same day. And while this was characterized as a conservation piece of legislation. It was viewed by the gun lobby and the, the uh, firearms lobby as a, as a gun bill. Second Amendment. Uh, a Second Amendment issue. Because they, view, they tend to view any restriction on ammunition like this, no matter how justified, as a, a threat to their issue. And so they fought very hard to get the legislature or the governor to not to approve the bill. So you can expect significant opposition from that particular lobby if you uh, decide to take this as you want. On the other hand, the hunting groups um, were largely either silent or opposed as well, partly because they were influenced by the gun lobby. And so there, that's, a that's another political dynamic that, that we, uh, we all dealt with. Um, the department and the commission are kind of caught in the middle of that and have the scar tissue to prove it, Dan and his colleagues. But, um, we have consistently focused on the wildlife and public health implications of lead exposure. Uh, one of the things that, that I didn't realize before we took this issue on is that um, batteries are the number one industrial use of lead. Number two industrial use of lead is ammunition. And ammunition hunting represents the largest intentional release of lead into the environment today. So um, it's an issue that uh, we didn't feel we could avoid because of its implications for wildlife, quite apart from the other issues that it raised. Yeah, I was going to try and give you a little more information specifically to your question. The dynamic we ran into was very interesting um, because uh, when you're dealing with the industry, uh, they supply more than just hunters. And what we ended up with is this very complex market dynamics when we first did the Condor, um, Barnes Bullets, for example, was one of the main manufacturers of uh, lead-free bullet, bullets you could use for hunting. They were very eager because they saw a huge gain in market share and, and sales. The other manufacturers went ballistic, pardon the pun, uh, because they weren't in that market. And so all of a sudden we were watching this fight, internal market fight and squabble within the industry right in front of us 
it was totally inadvertent. So kind of what the short answer to your question is, you're going to run into the same issue, which is supply and demand of a commodity, ammunition, that we have very or no control over. So that's going to be a wild card. It continues to be a major challenge. And frankly, I think at this point in California, the only issue left is the impacts of availability come hunting season when lead's no longer allowed. That's the big question mark anymore. We were able to, <clears throat> to clean up little technical things like the fact that you can't make a copper bullet without traces of lead. There, there are going to be trace elements in there, so how that definition of what is a lead projectile uh, is put into law is very important as well. So there's some technicality type things you have to step through. Any further questions or comments? Thank you. Okay, so state your name and address for the records, please. My name is Alan, A-L-L-E-N, last name Air, E-H-R. I'm a resident of Oregon. Uh, I came here, kind of, I didn't realize that this was going on right now. I thought it was set for a, a different time, but yet I didn't necessarily get all of it. Would you uh, please swing the mic into front of your face and talk into it? Thank you very okay. much. My name is Alan Air, E-H-R. Uh, our last name. I'm Can resident. You need your mailing address, please. Mailing address is P.O. Box 1753, Grants Pass, Oregon, 97528. Um, in, in going over this and understanding the NOAA was involved in the Fish and Wildlife Commission and all, I, this issue of the lead, and I understand some of the other stuff, and I didn't, I wasn't, I want to maybe say something about that towards the end. Um, I'm an environmental specialist. Uh, been doing this a lot of years that it basically is if we say environmentalists you go out there and you shake trees down and do some other stupid stuff well I'm one of the only civilians in Oregon that is wetlands waterways and endangered species certified along with uh, I do uh, water delineation for swamps and wetlands I understand the regulatory laws and there's there's lots of them and every every about every month we get about five or six added to it or they change directly um, what my concern was coming here today, and I was to the understanding that this, given California, Oregon, that this felt close to the issues of the d dams in Klamath and in Northern California, under the Copco Dam and the uh, Iron Gate Dam, um, talking about the idea of uh, removing these dams is going to create a whole new herd of fish, as it were, and I'm not trying to be, I'm trying to keep an upbeat on this whole thing. Um, I've lived in the Klamath area for about 37 years. I've been over in this area for some time also since the 70s after I got out of the military during Vietnam. What my concern is, uh, being a farmer, uh, being around, understanding livestock, animals, um, predators on your land, um, believe it or not, originally from Illinois, I've seen the wolf and they came down out of Canada. Uh, it's been many years ago, back in the 50s, but I did see them. I went up into Canada and did some hunting, grizzly bear and stuff. But my point in being here, and I'm not sure you know, what part I did miss, and I apologize to everybody here. I'm, trying to, I'm not trying to blindside anybody. Um, my biggest concern is if, if they've looked at, I mean, there's been a lot of things said about the dams. One of the things I was told most recently in the past two months that the Pacific Corp, the people that own the dams and the power, power plants on these, uh, with these dams, has actually applied for a 50-year permit, usage permit, which has been approved. So for 50 years, they want to use these facilities to provide electric and power. Taking that into consideration, the millions of dollars that Oregon and, Washington, or Oregon and California has spent trying to say the reason why we should take these dams out because fish can't get up upstream in the rivers and we need a whole new family and breed of fish. Well, just in the observation of the last three years, and by the way, my credentials are all EPA level. I deal with lead, asbestos, soil matrix, mold, hazmat, has a biochem, meth lab, certified at hair and radon. I carry Geiger counters and some of my tools and equipment to know what I'm dealing with. 
but I'm also out there in the level of certified labs that I send all my samples to. When I take samples, I do it on film. Uh, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a, 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 a scientist. I understand this because of what I've done all my life, and that's be part of it, be part of uh, what we are in the community. And the gentleman up here in the beginning talked about people on the water. That's a pretty good term, people on the water. People seeing the fish, people seeing the water, seeing what's in the water and what's going on. Over the years I go to classes, recertification every year, and I share with many state officials, government officials that are in the classes, we compare notes on what we find out in the systems, out in the, our conditions of our land. Um, I will share with you, and I'm sure folks from California, I'm trying to put a whole lot of emphasis on it, uh, Aaron Brockovich and the chromium, hexavalent chromium in Northern California, in little town of Hinkley. What that did is causing cancer. Now, I'm not here to debate it. I already know that it causes cancer. It's a carcinogen. All those things have been proven, otherwise they wouldn't have spent $337 million plus going on right now. Oregon's gonna spend, and the federal government's gonna spend 2.2 billion on hexavalent chromium. I am the guy who proved it was here in our river, in the Rogue River, where the fish are. I've also seen on our Rogue River Fish in the last three years, this would have been the fourth year, in September, fish came in, all different species. Cancer, cancer cysts throughout the body and the organs. We're time, we have five minutes, so you have one minute left. <laughs> I see, well some of the others went over five. I said, I'm not going to, please don't get me wrong, I appreciate being here. My concern is that um, taking out the dams with all the science, with all the, the evidence by the laboratories proves unequivocally that you can't just storm in there and tear a dam out. Besides, the Endangered Species Act under NOAA says you'll do a study three years prior to five years prior to removing, causing a major disturbance in a body of water. So I've even seen those studies get started under NOAA. They haven't taking a sample here and there, 12 samples behind one dam, and then find out we get hit with hexavalent chromium. A carcinogen that causes cancer, and we do have the highest levels of cancer in the state of Oregon, right here in southern Oregon. Most importantly, when you rush in, my concern is, you know, I didn't come to the presentation, I know the other gentleman was about 16 minutes, but the doctor, I believe, or what he was, my concern is, of what's here is evident. It's been shared countless times that it's here. The levels of cancer here, the levels of cancer in the fish. All these things you want to do, and it's important. When you guys say you want to see the fish come back, and you want, you want them to know they're there, and good, good groups of fish, good solid fish that you can eat, or, or watch, or whatever it is you want to do. We took out the only dam in Oregon that you could view the fish and count them here on the road. We took it out. The only way that you would know for sure to tell me 80,000 is what came this year. 80,000 wild came back up out of the ocean. Well, sad to say when I found out that mercury was in there just a few months ago, that number of 80,000 went to 2,342, give or take, for the state of Oregon on the Rogue River. Now that's a far cry from 80,000. And my point is, specifically with NOAA, my credentials will speak for themselves. The applications, the laboratories are all accredited that I've done my samples through. My point is, and it could fall on the same issues about lead. I am one of the highest level lead certified people. I'm a person that does risk assessments. I'm a person that does the research, toxicology, and a risk assessor for lead whether it's an instrumentation of guns, whether it's an instrument, instrumentation of in the river, pulling samples, I don't have samples. 0.128 of a pound is lead in the sediments that I pulled out of the river. Out of a ton, that's per ton. That's not very much lead. I thought for sure you guys were gonna talk a little bit about that because all the fish and the lead and this and that, but I get it, I understand. This is a little bit political, but I'm gonna tell you something. The way 
And I'm, I'm 63 years old. I've been down fishing when I was very young, introduced to hunting, um, skeet shooting, trap shooting, so I understand the usage factors. You've kind of, you, kind of got a, a mix here. Be careful what ground you tread on. And I'm saying this as an experienced person being out in the open. Oh, you're going to have to wrap it up. What my concern is that the level that you people from NOAA want to give reclamation point permits and permits to make it better. One, one last thing. When they took the dams out, they had no clue what was in there in the sediments. Bottom line, we talk about global warming and temperatures of water. Most importantly, these sediments that were behind the dam are black, not brown, not orange, not red, black. Now, anybody that's had Science 101 would know that when this black material starts moving from where it was and disturbed all the way to the ocean right now and out, guaranteed rising temperature in 45 minutes from the time the sun comes up over the mountain in setting still pools that will move occasionally during the day on the river, 27 degrees in 45 minutes. That's a rise that is unsurmountable and yet you want to fix it. We need to slow down a little bit we need to look really close at what's going on because the very idea to save the fish and not put ladders in and take the dams out, not understand anything about percolation that cools the water for those fish, that's what does that. I haven't heard anybody talk about it here. Percolation through our sediments and our lands and our, our rock and our formations along the river is what cools that water to allow those fish to come. They ain't going to come. You take those dams out in the climate, they ain't going to come because of the hot springs. They do not like alkalinity in the water, not that way. And I guess the bottom line of that is, yeah, we have uh, algae bloom, another monster, poisonous. Can't fish, can't eat the fish. I've already created a way, solid and proof, because that algae, when dried, is pure nitrogen an item you can use for planting or farming or fertilizer that won't hurt anybody. But yet when you take it out of that river, out of that lake, and collect it and dry it and turn it to fertilizer, somebody's going to make the money from doing it. You're going to clean the water, you're going to cool the water, the fish are going to come. And until you do it, all that you want to do, all these hatcheries, these fish hatcheries, the, common, the regular fish coming in the, from the ocean, from up north and everything else, it's not going to happen. You're going to keep smacking your head into the rocks. Because unless you start from the very bottom, <coughs> as we've been taught, in the field of, and they've changed it, the Federation of <laughs> Conservation. Has anybody ever seen one of those books in school? That's how, what we were taught from, the Federation of Conservation. I have a complete set of Alan, books. Alan, you're going to have to, just get us a minute. Any commissioners, do you have any questions of Alan? I'm sorry that I have other people and we still have a round table to go to. I understand. Do you have any papers that you can leave us to look at? I don't at this time because I wasn't prepared. I found out less than 35 minutes before that I got here. You can bring it back tomorrow and leave them with our secretaries in the back. We as appreciate a, As a veteran, I'm dealing with a lot of things right now and I'd be more than glad to. By the way, some of you folks know Mr. John Menke, professor from Davis. Look it up, he's one of the leading fish biologists and, and, and teachers. He's taught 80% of the people in Oregon and know him. They all know him. That, ask that man. Give, let him give his two cents about what's going on. He'll astound you. Thank you very much. Um, Roy Hall. And I noticed that Betty had signed up too. Is she going to speak or just you? Come on up, Betty. <laughs> name and address for the records, please. Uh, my name is Roy Hall, Chief of the yeah. Shasta Nation. It's a local tribe here. Uh, oh, my address is 10808 Fort Valley Road, Fort Jones. California, Scott Valley. Uh, <clears throat> what I really want to talk about is uh, our sovereignty and uh, how it has 
not affected the KBRA. Uh, Mr. Bonham, I believe, brought up that there were four tribes on the Klamath River. Uh, we were not one of them. Uh, they were federally recognized tribes. Federal recognition is tribes that are on the government dole. They're on government welfare. All tribes have tribal sovereignty. That's where tribes get their power. Tribal sovereignty existed before the Constitution, and we have tribal sovereignty. That is our power. And uh, there are five, four counties in California and four counties in Oregon that are impacted by the Shasta Indian lands. And those lands, we still hold title, original title to those lands. The federal government does not. Uh, an Indian or Indian tribe cannot convey title of their land to anyone or any state except by treaty to the federal government, and that has never been done. The state of California, the state of Oregon, do not have legal, lawful title to Indian lands in these eight counties, in Oregon and Washington, Oregon and California. And uh, all these regulatory laws uh, that are unconstitutional are not lawful. Uh, anything any laws and legislation that are created outside of the Constitution are a nullity. They are not legal. And uh, on the KBRA, there was 47 entities, I believe, federal, state, tribes, NGOs that participated and uh, they are all stakeholders. <clears throat> I believe that many of you today have referred to yourselves as stakeholders. And I, I ask you to ask yourselves, what is a stakeholder? I mean, really, what is a stakeholder? Uh, stakeholders are regional governments. Regional governance is extra constitutional. It is not of the Constitution of the United States of America. Uh, it is unlawful. The KBRA <coughs> created by stakeholders to take out the dams is totally unlawful. Uh, for the dams to come out, I'm a little nervous, <laughs> but anyway. No worry, we only you, fight once. Okay, you uh, you get the idea here. Uh, so this is where our tribe is coming from. Uh, this is not going to happen. We're going to use the law of the land. The Constitution is the law of the land, and uh, I believe those that you, any of you that are public officials have taken the oath of of office to uphold the Constitution of the United States and that hold the laws, and that's all we ask. Go ahead, Commissioner. I'm, I'm a little confused. Um, you hold title, I mean state or federal title to your land? No, we hold aboriginal title. Okay. It has never been extended. That now explains the whole thing. Thank you very much. Yes. Betty, go ahead. I'm Betty Hall. My address is 10736 Quartz Valley Road, Fort Jones, California, 96032. And uh, I'm going to read you a document I read to some of you in Mount Shasta yesterday, and I'm going to, I know the other commissioners from Oregon need to hear it also. And it says, Shasta Nation unextinguished Aboriginal lands. The Shasta Nation, Shasta Nation Indian lands with unextinguished Aboriginal title, including but not limited to Shasta County, northern section of Trinity County, Siskiyou County, northern section of Modoc County, counties of the Republic of California, 
under the United States of America, the western section of Klamath County, Jackson County, Josephine County, Curry Counties of the State of Oregon, under the Constitution of the United States of America. Not to be confused with the Corporation of the United States, or the Corporation of the State of California, or the Corporation of the State of Oregon. These lands will be negatively impacted by any introduction or presence of any species of wolves, or will be subject to the Shasta Nation Wolf Ordinance. Now here's the Shasta Nation Ordinance. Shasta Nation Tribal Wolf Ordinance number 3182013 and this is dated uh, March 18th, 2013. Article 1, the Shasta Nation is a sovereign tribal authority with status that above state governments. The Tribal Council of the Shasta Nation hereby finds and declares that there exists within the Aboriginal territory of the Shasta Nation an imposed issue of wolf integration into the ecosystem and habitable Indian lands and are declared not suitable for any wolf population. Section A, tribal sovereignty preempts state power within Indian lands. Indian lands and title have never been incorporated into the United States government by treaty. Section B, the Shasta Nation reserves the right to exercise jurisdiction over all tribal matters and of tribal interests within Shasta Indian lands through their tribal council, tribal court, and tribal police department. Article 2, the Shasta Nation hereby imposes this tribal ordinance prohibiting the release and or presence of wolves in Shasta tribal sovereign Indian lands. Section A, such actions shall be null and void with the exception of the Shasta Nation determining that there is sufficient evidence to support wolves in the Shasta Indian lands. Section B, any state action in regard to the introduction of wolves in Indian lands shall be declared unlawful by the Shasta Nation. And the U.S. Constitution, any efforts to move forward on any and all plans affecting the Shasta Nation Indian lands shall be declared unlawful. Section C, any wolf that are introduced within the Shasta exterior boundaries will be subject to removal. In fairness to the animal and safety to inhabitants of the Shasta Indian lands and livestock <coughs> thereof. Uh, I also want to mentioned I was concerned about the map you showed when you started the first film. I think about the third one, you had a map. And you had the names of the tribes, it shows where, where they were. You have the Karuk, and the color of that whole thing for the Karuk is Shasta Lands. If you know the Klamath River, do you know where Clear Creek is below Happy Camp? Okay, that's where the Shasta meet the the group tribe. And like the group are from Clear Creek down the Klamath River to Bluff Creek. That's their Aboriginal land. From Clear Creek, clear to the headwaters of the Klamath River is Shasta lands. Aboriginal lands. There's hundreds of burials, grave sites, sacred sites on that river. Our sacred sites and burial grounds are under the water of those dams, of those reservoirs. There wasn't anything we could do about it when they went in. Now they're there. What's going to happen when those dams come out? You're going to wash all the bones of my ancestors down the river? Well, Betty, when it's, it's, with, it's really hard to, to think about. I can see the distress in your voice and on your face, and I wish there was something that we could do about it, but um, this is something that you have to take up with the government, not with the commission. Okay. Can't you say, hey, and I, I can't change the that, because I don't have, we don't have control of that part of it. Okay, just a minute. The governor of Oregon, and I know the governor of California is fortunate, they couldn't sign the KBR thing fast enough. In the beginning. I mean, I know it made sense, but I don't see why our governors of either, either country or your commission say, hey, do the research. Hey, we looked at this and it doesn't look right. 
You can say no. I don't think you're required by law to do something that's illegal. Think about it. Um, I appreciate your, your comments. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Do you want a copy of this? Sure, let me take a copy of it. That'd be nice. And if you'll take it to um, uh, Amanda, would you stand up so she can give it to you so she can make copies for all this? Oh, uh, Michelle's going to take it. Thank you very much. I have another article I've written. I, I'll give it to her also. And it's titled, uh, The Klamath River is People and, it's, and the Fish, you know, of, of that. And uh, it's absolutely, totally documented. It's history of, of what on that river and it will, you need to read it.